Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Pratik Tambe, chairperson for the AMOX Endocrinology Committee, and a very warm welcome to you, all of you respected faculty, as well as audience who have logged in today for our program, which is themed on high-risk pregnancy. Today's program is in association with four societies: the Greater Noida, Merit, Varanasi, and Haldwani societies. and we are very proud to welcome the office bearers of these societies as our distinguished faculty for this program to start with can we have the next slide please i'd like to express my gratitude to the office bearers of emox our president dr nandita palshetkar who doesn't know her she is the immediate past president of foxy and the current president of emox also been the president of the mumbai society iag in the past and the chairperson of the maharashtra chapter of isar today unfortunately madam was supposed to deliver a lecture on pregnancy in the elderly but today there is a government of india meeting on the art bill which has been called at very short notice and as I, as you can see in the cv there she is a member of that national guideline and art bill group so she has to be there for that meeting it's starting at 2 o'clock unfortunately at the same time if she finishes early she will log in and she will join us and deliver her talk but if it's not possible she has requested us to please excuse her we would like to place on record our gratitude to the emox office bearers and our president for always being there and supporting us in all our academic endeavors next slide please i'm also very proud to welcome our co convener for today's program dr arch awards the best committee award from foxy and she has been the organizing secretary of north zone of foxy in the past we welcome dr archana verma to introduce our chairpersons for today i would yes. request dr archana verma to go alternately with me we'll start with dr arun nayak who is the secretary of amogs and for his formal introduction i hand over to archana ma'am yeah very uh, warm welcome and uh, uh, good afternoon to each and everybody and i uh, my proud privilege to introduce dr arun nayak who is a md uh, from bombay dio ficog fellowships in endoscopic surgery from korea he is a professor and head of the department in lt mnc and lt mg sion hospital mumbai she was he was a uh, president of mogs uh, in uh, 2015 2016 and secretary three amox uh, at present in, in, in which is uh, all all maharashtra ops and gynae societies and uh, as a uh, he is a uh, visiting uh, clinic clinical fellowships in uh, uh, jingnam university hospital korea and uh, joint assistant editor foxy journal of ops and gynae and winner of the foxy korean award which is very very precious one and prestigious winner of the hargobin medical fellowships for overseas training trained in laparoscopy is more than 40, he has more than 40 publications and with special interest in stress urinary incontinence and dvh and perform more than 250 sui surgeries including tvt tot and he is mci inspector also for assessing medical colleges for recognition so uh, mind it and joint organizing secretary aicog 2013 held at a mumbai and which was very very successful thank you ma'am and uh, on a personal note sir has been my president in the mumbai society always very kind gracious yes, very and, kind and a gentleman gracious. kind of person always supporting and promoting us youngsters and we thank him for always being there for us i just spoke to him 2 minutes volume. before we started sir is driving and he will join us in a very short while so we look forward to his presence next slide please we are also very privileged to have with us dr parul kotadawala who is the vice chairman of icog he is also the vice president of isopar he has been a vice president of foxy in the year 2006 president of sogog in 2009 president of the amdavad society in 2007 to 8 another very distinguished gentleman who seems to be timeless and ageless he looks the same since the past 20 years since i first saw him 
and we are really privileged to have sir with us today as one of our chairpersons. We welcome Dr. Parul Kotadawala. Next slide, please. Very good evening. And uh, next one, chairperson, we are proud uh, to have Dr. Kirti Dubey. Uh, she is a professor in Department of uh, Ops and Gyni, LLR Medical College, Meerut, and has more than 30 years of experience in teaching and research. And she is a very, very kind-hearted lady and an uh, ex principal of LLR uh, Medical College, Meerut, and a uh, member of number of medical societies, including uh, Foxy, and NAVC and UP chapter, UP, UPCOG and IMA and has several publications in various peer review journals. It's on editorial board of journal of UP chapter and she uh, as a mainly into the research also and uh, as a reproductive medicine and in the limited resource of working in a government hospital, her interest in infertility and high risk pregnancy has really helped thousands of patients in their struggle and she's a uh, uh, consultant of many, 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 many gynecologists in the mirror. Very, very uh, motherly-like figure. Welcome, Next Dr. Kiyo Dube, ma'am. Next slide, please. Yeah. We have with us Dr. Gulati, also known as Colonel Sahab. He is the president of the Greater Noida OBGYN Society, professor of OBGYN of Medical Sciences and Research in Greater Noida. He has 20 years of experience in Army and Medical Colleges, has won a silver medal in AFMC Pune, presented papers at various national and international conferences, and sir, special interests include urogynecology, integrative medicine in obstetrics and gynec, and circadian rhythms and melatonin in human pregnancy outcome. Sir is very rarely seen, but I have had the privilege of meeting him once physically when we did a program in Noida long back in a different era when we used to have physical meetings and it's always a pleasure to welcome him for one of our webinars as well. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Next slide, please. Uh, she is not here, probably. Yeah, Dr. Uma Pandey is the president of the Varansi Society and she is held up at the BHU today with work and she has said she will join as and when she is free. We thank her for being associated with us for this event. And we proceed to the next slide. Dr. Achanavar Mama, do you want to introduce? You are muted, ma'am. Uh, hi, Dr. Ravinder Jeet Khurana. It's uh, uh, so nice to talk about you. I just met her only a few uh, days back, rather weeks back. And she's a senior consultant, OB and gynae in Krishna Hospital and Research Center, Haldwani. Very, very vibrant uh, doctor. And uh, at present, she's president and past president of IMA Haldwani also and past vice president, Foxy Uttarakhand. And her area of interest is genitourinary surgeries and vaginal rejuvenation. So we'll proceed with the scientific program before we hand over to the chairpersons for the further proceedings. Just one small announcement to make for those of you who have got delayed and logged in a little late. We were supposed to have two speakers. The first speaker was our esteemed president of MOGS, Dr. Nandita Palchetkar. Unfortunately, today we have a Government of India meeting on the ART bill and Madam is one of the important dignitaries at that meeting. She has said she will try and join in as and when she is free. But before we proceed with the second speaker, who is Dr. Archana Verma herself on the topic of RH ICU immunization, I would like to invite our esteemed chairpersons to please give us their blessings. We have Dr. Arun Nayak with us. Sir, good afternoon. It's lovely to see you. And Dr. Yeah. Parul Kotadawala after that. Hello. Any words of wisdom from you, sir, for the assembled audience and dignitary? Hello. Can yes, you, sir, we can hear you. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, good afternoon, everybody. It's always a pleasure uh, to join a webinar organized by Prati and uh, the scientific content of all the webinars organized by him are always of a high standard. Uh, Dr. Archana Varma, Madam, good afternoon. Madam, you are muted. Madam? Long time. Hello, Dr. Arun Naik, sir. Hello. Hello, madam. Long time. 
आई वॉज अबाउट टू टेल प्रतीक सेट यहाँ पे कोई ज्यादा फैशन ड्रामे की बात नहीं होगी बट आई वॉन्टेड टू से डॉक्टर अरुण नायक लुक्स बेटर देन एनी हॉलीवुड एक्टर मैडम नाउ इट इज कोविड एरिया कोविड एरिया हेलो यस सर वी कैन हियर यू सर या इट इज कोविड एरिया मैडम नाउ सो इट्स डिफरेंट नाउ एंड मैडम लुकिंग फॉरवर्ड टू लिसनिंग टू यू एंड ऑल द बेस्ट मैडम एंड प्रतीक थैंक यू वेरी मच सर कैन वी हैव डॉक्टर पारुल कोटड़ावाल टू एड्रेस द गैदरिंग प्लीज So good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Pratik, my compliments to you to bring on the same uh, platform <laughs> like, from a distant part of India, and this is feasible only through internet. See, in physical conferences, we could not have matched all these four together, isn't it? Yes, sir. Silver lining. My compliments to you for bringing this together. Uh, I believe the topic. Uh, for dr archana is rh isoimmunization right yes now, sir rh is a very wonderful topic if you really look back you would realize that we learned about the blood groups so disease we used to know that uh, we had um, fetuses with this kind of a situation iud used to happen but we learned the cause of the disease in 1940s when we got the blood groups know subsequently very soon we learned the cause of the uh, disease in this form of antibodies that these are crossing the placenta and causing the disease within 20 years we also found the cure that intrauterine transfusion is the treatment and then we found out the prevention of the disease in form of ntd antiglobulin so this is perhaps the only example where a disease was identified since long but its cause was identified then within a short period of time the mechanism was identified then the cure was identified and then the prevention was identified in a span of just 30 to 40 years this is one of the shining example of medical thought process and scientific way of dealing with an issue subsequently only some uh, um, more uh, deliberation has occurred in form of better quality of antibodies and better way to do intrauterine transfusion but everything happened in a span of just 30 years so that way rh is a glowing example of uh, scientific thought and i am sure dr archana will uh, highlight every aspect of this disease thank you for calling me to uh, chair this session thank you so much sir for joining us I, we know you are very busy and you are rarely seen outside the ot but today we are really privileged to have you with us thank you so much for joining if dr kirti dube and dr ravinder jit kurana would like to say something before we start i saw dr kirti dube madam join in briefly i think her audio and video is off hmm dr kirti was here yeah she was ah, just she here. here yes madam madam unmute kar lijiye hello ma'am ma'am unmute kar lijiye am i audible yes, yes ma'am yes, ma please go ahead ma'am a oh, very good afternoon to archana dr tabe yes. and at the outset i'm really thankful that you all have invited me to chair sessions which are really um, worthwhile and very near to my heart a high risk pregnancy and i think uh, of course all of us are every day seeing these patients of rh isoimmunization and um, we as obstetricians are very much nowadays interested about looking after elderly patients who conceive because most of the girls are because of their profession they conceive late so we would like this will really add something to what we already know and we are just waiting to hear the talk of elderly primary gravidas elderly gravidas to look in the antenatal care and of course dr archana we would love to hear you as regards our rh iso immunization and already i have heard uh, what all we can gain uh, by uh, hearing of rh iso immunization though of course as he has said that this is something not very old it has been just found out in this very century uh, very i would not say 
somewhere in the early 19th century and uh, we would really love to hear you archana okay a very good afternoon to all of you thank you madam it is really very nice to have our professors like i already told dr kirti madam that you are more like a mother figure to all the upc audience so it's my really i am happy to present i am like almost uh, not into the academics uh, you know <laughs> but it uh, if i am presenting then you are here to support me <laughs> sure sure it's my pleasure archana it's my pleasure thank you so much ma'am i can see colonel gulati sahab and dr ravinder jit kurana both are here you would yes. invite them to please address the gathering hello everyone i am dr ravinder kurana actually it's really it's great privilege to be on this forum right now and it's, it's the first time ever i have come on a such a forum forum for me it is a great privilege to be in this and uh, the topics under discussion are really great and uh, this these are the things which we come to we face day to day practice iso rh iso immunization is a great topic and uh, so is uh, recurrent pregnancy losses and all these so thank you so much thank you so much ma'am dr gulati sir dr ravinder jit na dr pratik i have yeah, been after her tum idhar chair person bano idhar talk de do idhar aao mere sath <laughs> chalo and she is very sweet okay 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 It's always good to welcome new people into the Foxy family. Yes. Dr. Gulati, sir, any words of wisdom from you before we start, sir? Welcome, Dr. Gulati, sir. I think, sir, his internet may be unstable. Yeah. Abi ho raha hai, sir. Connect. Ha. Sir, good Hello. afternoon. Can you hear us? Hello. Yeah, I think there's some audio issues. Doctor Chana, ma'am, I think we should proceed. It's already two seventeen p.m. Okay. We should start with the first talk. It's quite late already. Thank you so much, okay. ma'am. Backend team, request you to mute everybody else, please. Ah, uh, can you see my uh, this? Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. We can okay. see and hear you very clearly. Okay, okay. Please go ahead. Okay. So, so I start right. from the beginning only a history has already been told by dr parul and this aluminization or rh incompatibility is a really uh, a, a topic which it really needs so much of care and awareness and thank you dr pratik for giving me this topic do i will try to do a, a, a little bit justice with this uh, and it is actually uh, uh, that uh, rh factor problems comes after the marriage is when you are planning for a uh, pregnancy and to know your partner well uh, 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 you must know uh, other than your education and qualification about the genetics also so uh, as a little a scientific uh, word about uh, this uh, aluminization that it is a production of antibodies in an individual in response to foreign red cells antigen actually here the prop antigen is the uh, rh positive baby inside the womb of a mother and who when she is uh, rh negative and there is a rhesus conflict and uh, the antigen is act as as we know that derived from the another individual of the same species so when we talk about the blood group we shouldn't talk only about hey i am a rh positive and uh, the, all the a group groups are the more conservative responsible cautious and punctual and ab are this and ab are this and o are this so but the bloody fact about the ab and rh group is we must know that they are mainly uh, though uh, uh, a and b and ab and o blood group where the a is the antigen a it is carrying and it is having the anti b antibodies and there is no antigen uh, b present in the a group and no anti a antibody 
likewise the o is um, neither it has uh, any antigen but it has antibodies a and antibodies b inside and ab it's opposite it's a uh, uh, a uh, is antigen a is present antigen b is present and anti uh, a and b both the antibodies are not there and there are 30 different blood group systems and 328 red cell antigens recognized by international society of blood transfusion and another was a rhesus blood group which uh, rhesus uh, the uh, rh positive uh, is means that d antigen is uh, present and there is no antibody and rh negative there is no antigen and there is no antibody and there are actually other 35 antigen also in this rh group other than these five main c c d and uh, e e at the uh, 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 a little bit about the rh antigen it was like very well already discussed that landstino in 1940 discovered this by put, uh, make, uh, uh, seeing that when he injected the uh, blood of a uh, rhesus uh, monkey into the rabbit and they found some antibodies and actually it was the first time uh, uh, long back uh, there was a uh, so many uh, uh, the lady uh, was uh, there who had twins and when uh, the they she uh, all the both the twins they expired soon after the birth then this uh, scared uh, the, all the people were scared of this uh, why the feet, uh, all the neonates are dying so when uh, all these things uh, researches were going on first something came then something came and something came and then it was find out that there was a rhesus rhesus is on because of the this rhesus is a small monkey found in the india and the, uh, this groups were there and it is mainly uh, autosomal dominant antigen found on the short arm of the chromosome 1 and it is most immunogenic that is why it creates lot, uh, immediate uh, very high level of antibody productions and all those person who are lacking d antigen on the rbc they are rh called rh negative and it this rh group is uh, uh, found exactly 38 day after conception uh, it is as found and this rh group is generally only uh, uh, importance is in during the pregnancy and the incidence is that uh, uh, chinese and japanese they almost have less than 1% and sometimes uh, we can say that uh, japan mein there is uh, even zero we can say and india it is 5 to 8% and the caucasians it is 15% and uh, uh, then the thing is this who is the miscreant ho kya raha hai what is a positive uh, factor behind it so a little bit about the placenta usually the placenta acts as a barrier to fetal blood entering maternal circulation in the aapas mein kabhi bhi koi itna ye jo syncytiotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast is tarike se bane hue hote hain ki iska blood mixing hota nahi hai but naturally always the mother antibodies jo ki they are very good for other reasons they go to always go via this placenta to the uh, uh, fetus and they are very very protective uh, uh, because the Im fetal immune system is not developed so much and they go via breastfeeding also but here but sometimes during pregnancy or birth this fetal maternal hemorrhages like also called fmh they can occur and the this immune the this fetal rbc as soon as they enter the maternal blood sometimes if they are abo incompatible then they are destroyed and uh, the reaction is not so much but uh, it is it sometimes it causes antibody productions in the mother so what is the this a uh, broken barrier sometimes which happens it is called fetal maternal hemorrhage and in antenatal periods it's not so much uh, 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 not more than 10% and the majority and mainly it is the postpartum 90% of the fmh the in the postpartum period and a very small amount of the blood can be responsible for this antibody production and the pathogenesis about this disease is you can see this of uh, uh, this beautiful uh, beautiful presentation where uh, rh negative mother and uh, lady and rh positive husband and when she get pregnant and, and the baby is rh positive and then uh, uh, all this uh, this plus plus you can see the now it's going in the uh, um, uh, maternal blood and she develops uh, antibodies 
at the moment than the next pregnancy or even this pregnancy they can uh, enter the fetus blood and uh, circulation and they can do the hemolysis so this is a simple charting where you can see that when the fetus is rh negative then there is no problem but if it is rh uh, positive fetus then this rh positive rbcs they when they enter maternal circulation and if the mother is previously sensitized or second this is called secondary immune response then this causes much more hemolysis and but if it is non it happens to non sensitized non sensitized mother uh, this is also called primary immune response so there is a difference in the secondary immune response and the primary induced response so this primary immune response this causes uh, this uh, when it happens they are mainly the igm antibodies and they generally don't it takes time to develop them and uh, uh, <coughs> and uh, 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 later on when the uh, uh, second production of uh, igg antibodies occur then they enter uh, uh, the fetal breast circulation so the first fetus is generally unaffected and first baby usually escape but mother gets sensitized so this this word is to be noted that this is sensitizing pregnancy one is so and the uh, uh, thoda simple simple way mein rh negative mother carrying the rh positive fetus and there is a uh, entry of the fetal r r red, uh, red blood cells into the maternal circulation and then there is a development of the rh antibodies this is the fetal maternal hemorrhage and the point to remember is this if one mole of the rh positive blood enters it causes 15 percent chances of uh, uh, immunization and if it is more than 10 mole then it is more uh, around 33 percent and primary response is dose dependent but secondary response is initiated even with the 0.03 ml of blood so we need to uh, 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 मेक श्योर दैट दिस सेकेंडरी रेस्पॉन्स को हम किसी भी तरीके से इसको रोक पाए सो द फीटो मेटरनल हेमरेजेस आर द मेनी दे आर मेनी एंटीनेटल टाइम में दे आर मेनी कॉजेज विच आर ऑल्सो कॉल द सेंसिटाइजिंग इवेंट्स एंड दीज आर नेमली अबॉर्शन एक्टॉपिक प्रेगनेंसी मोलर प्रेगनेंसी एंड एनी प्रोसीजर इन्वेस्टिव प्रोसीजर्स लाइक कॉर्डोसेंटेसिस एम्यूसेंटेसिस एंड कोरियोनिक वेलस सैम्पलिंग and attempted version also manual removal of the placenta any trauma to the abdomen anti partum hemorrhages and vaginal delivery and cesarean section for an instrumental delivery like for a delivery and placental abrasion and any blood transfusion uh, in the uh, pre pregnancy stage also and the chances in the first trimester are only 5% and in the third trimester it is maximum Uh, second trimester it is 46% and in the third trimester it is maximum around 75% at the time of delivery and the risk of sensitization in relation to volume of the fmh is 0.1 ml may, there are only 3% and it is more than 5 ml it is around 65% so this is sensitizing so this is the first pregnancy the uh, it is dose dependent and this fetal maternal hemorrhages in spite of all antenatal and postnatal prophylaxis we still uh, 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 patient uh, uh, we are still having patients of rh aluminization and so uh, one thing is ki how where the failure is going on and the second is a quantitative test is needed to detect fmh at least because this is the rcog recommendation and but some in uh, in india we are not doing it and uh, this uh, hemoglobin f by flow cytometry and the and, and this clay horse bed kit test is done and the test uh, for uh, generally to see the fetal maternal hemorrhages has happened or not a simple test is rosette test we are a maternal uh, blood sample is tested and they uh, when we uh, uh, see and the mix it in the smear is taken then they the fetal breast cells they appear as uh, a pinkish color so that's why its name is like this and then there is a cleohar bed kit test it, it determines the amount of the positive fetal Uh, cells present in the mother's blood and other tests to detect fmh are flow cytometry and enzyme linked antiglobulin test and something surrogate test i don't know really but it is was written in the notebook so i have had, uh, come here so once it is diagnosed and uh, you are thinking and so aim of the antenatal management in in a uh, rh negative pregnancy is number 1 to predict which pregnancy is at risk 
Number two, to predict whether or not the fetus is severely affected. Number three, to correct anemia and reverse head drops by intrauterine fetal uh, transfusion. And to deliver the baby at appropriate time and weighing the risk of prematurity against those of intrauterine transfusion. So we have to think कि हमको कब delivery करनी है और या कब we are capable of doing intrauterine transfusions also. And the objective of antenatal care is in the non-immunized woman prevention of the early immunization and in the immunized woman early detection. and adequate treatment of the fetal anemia when we are patient is coming we must take a good history if we, the patient if the patient is primary gravida with no previous history of blood transfusion or mtp or anything it is quite unlikely that the baby will be affected and in a paras woman a detailed obstetric history has to be taken and the classical history of सारे पेशेंट बता देते हैं हमारा बच्चे को पी लिया हुआ था फिर उसको ब्लड चढ़ने की नौबत आ गई थी फिर वी कुड सेव द बेबी सो ये दिस दिस ट्वेल्बर्स और न्योनेटल डेथ ड्यू टू सीवियर जॉन्डिस दे आर वेरी वेरी सजेस्टिव एंड पेशेंट ये भी बता देता है कि एक महंगा सा इंजेक्शन लगाया था डिलीवरी के बाद and uh, so the rh negative mother uh, if when it is diagnosed that she is rh negative we quickly must go for the husband blood group and if the husband blood group is negative he can smile the, both of them and the rh positive uh, if the husband is rh positive then the indirect combs test is recommended and uh, there is another uh, way of uh, determining fetal rh factor by the non invasive fetal cell testing for rh d gene cell free Uh, cell free fetal dna also called cf dna but it is a little expensive and uh, and other is a uh, invasive uh, corio uh, villus sampling uh, both of them but uh, if we keep in mind that prevention is better than cure then we can go for those uh, this cell free dna testing because it will uh, somehow uh, lessen the uh, headache of the pregnant patient and family and of course gynecologist and the indirect comb test when we do is it is actually uh, the um, indirect to uh, determine the level of the antibody and the antibody titer here we, what we do is we take the patient blood and uh, it is uh, uh, washed and in this we add a uh, uh, known rh positive blood and uh, keep it for some time and then uh, add anti uh, hum, uh, human globulin and when we see under the microscope and the it is seen that agglutination is uh, is seen so this is uh, and the, uh, if the titer is uh, then titer is noted ki how much concentration is required for this uh, uh, this thing so if the titer is more than 116 if the severity of the condition should be evaluated so and a word about antibody titer the critical value see the critical value is one at which hydrops can develop so uh, it, it is critical for hydrops and it is typically between 1 is to 8 and 1 is to 32 this this thing is uh, with a reference to iron iron donald uh, book uh, uh, and we are doctor uh, our own doctor dr alka kuplani she uh, she did a lot of written so many work uh, uh, and the, all the they are fetal medicine department and it uh, varies in different labs so it is this uh, one is to eight to one is to 38 and uh, two is taken and the problem is severity of disease see this is point is to be noted the problem of the severity of disease may not be dependent on quantity but also on the suppose one it is one one is to uh, 32 in one patient and the baby is not affected so much and in another it is only one is to eight and the baby is affected very badly so this also depend on the maturity of the fetal immune system and the type of a different antibodies also and late and if it is too much then the other the other um, uh, fetal, uh, fetal uh, surveillance other methods has to be taken uh, i've written invasive but not it is not invasive but um, uh, very close fetal monitoring is needed and screening of the uh, for the aluminization in the first pregnancy it should be done at the first at the booking and then 20 weeks and then 28 weeks and in subsequent pregnancy if the previous pregnancy with no or mild hemolytic disease history then at the first week booking and then every 4 to 6 weeks uh, subsequently but if 
द प्रीवियस प्रेगनेंसी विद सीवियर ह्यूमोलेटिक डिजीज इज देयर लाइक यू नो द हिस्ट्री दैट प्रीवियस बेबी वॉज बैडली इफेक्टेड दे वॉज अ लॉट ऑफ जॉन्डिस एंड फीटल एनीमिया सो वी वन शुड नॉट कीप द पेशेंट विद दैम दे शुड बी रेफर्ड दे शुड बी मैनेज एंड referred at a uh, higher center where experienced team is there fetal medicine experts are there and the perinatal center is going and the testing for the fetal anemia is, uh, starts begin right from 16 to 18 weeks so uh, once you de- this is a level charting ki combs test hua negative aaya to iska matlab hai abhi no isoimmunization is present and management of the na- na- non isoimmunized mother is simple is a, you have to minimize the chances of fetal fetal maternal hemorrhages and preventing the immunization by giving ntd so it uh, ntd is given at the 28 weeks of gestation onwards and within uh, 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 Seven, uh, after post partum also and if the patient is icd positive ya yeah, combs test positive then this is called rh isoimmunized pregnancy here we we, we as uh, antibody titer and the critical titer is again that this much and this monitor fetal man, uh, anemia and if it is less than uh, 16 then uh, keep on if it less than 1 1 to 1 uh, 1 is to 16 that keep on repeating every 4 weeks and deliver at 37 completed week and if it is more than 116 then the go for another biophysical uh, monitoring of the uh, fetus like uh, ultrasound and the doppler where we do the middle cerebral artery peak systolic velocity and the because rh uh, incompatibility is mainly causing hemolytic disease of the fetus and uh, it is uh, either mild moderate or severe in the mild case the hemolysis is tolerated by the fetus and the, uh, at the time of birth you notice only mild anemia and jaundice and usually resolves and moderate is uh, when there is a increased circulating bilirubin which is uh, uh, internally uh, cleared by placenta and after birth immediate there is too much of jaundice and sometimes conictus may, may uh, uh, happen and this sometimes detrimental for the fetal brain also and this require immediate postnatal treatment and the severe ones are real severe which we are afraid of this is fe- uh, severe fetal anemia and there is a hepatosplenomegaly and it Just uh, in the uh, circulation because the lot of destruction going on. So this uh, this was also previously called as erythroblastosis fetalis, and there are chances of fetal cardiac uh, failure, fetal high drops, and uh, still birth, and on the worse in your natal death. And the testing for uh, uh, this uh, by ultrasound, CVS, amniocentesis, photosynthesis, and MCA. So C- uh, CVS is uh, uh, generally sometimes it best to know the fetal Rh genotype. Early detection it causes, but it disadvantages are it is more complicated. Everybody cannot do it, and uh, increase the severity of aluminization is there if the baby is Rh positive, and it is invasive test also. so signs of fetal anemia on ultrasound ultrasound is the best modality nowadays available for the obstetrician and gynecologists so when we found uh, polyhydramnios and hyperplacentosis hyperplacentosis is actually an effort to increase the transfer of oxygen to the because there so much of the fetal red cells so wo aur zyada grow or develop hone lagta hai taki wo aur zyada blood oxygen le leke baby ki taraf ja sake and then there is a fetal ascites hai and uh, hepatosplenomegaly uh, you must look for an increase right atrial size because of the congestive heart failure and the fetal high drops which is generalized edema and the what is hydro uh, the ultrasonographic ultrason- sono- features of the high drops fetalis are that the ground glass uh, placenta and uh, there is a ascites pleural fusion pericardial effusion and the po- baby because of so much of uh, uh, fluid and uh, less no movement uh, it, it sits like a buddha so that is called a buddha posture and there is a hello sign because of the around the skull because of the too much of the subcutaneous edema on the scalp and the uh, this middle cerebral artery we will also look for and there chances of fetal death because of the this thing and the one uh, before going to the middle cerebral artery uh, i would like to say that there are certain maternal effect of rh aluminization sometimes also because generally it is the baby is suffering 
एंड द मदर में कम होता है बट देर इज अ चांसेस ऑफ हाइपर प्लेसेंटोसिस एंड चांसेस ऑफ डेवलपिंग प्री एक्लेम्सिया एंड फ्यू कॉम्प्लिकेशन बिकॉज ऑफ द एम्यूसेंटेसिस एंड देर इज दो इट इज नॉट वेरी कॉमन बट आई वॉन्टेड टू जस्ट शेयर दिस बैलेंटाइन सिंड्रोम दिस इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड मेटर्नल मिरर सिंड्रोम बिकॉज द मदर फिजिकली एंड अल्ट्रासोनोलॉजिकली द बेबी और द आफ्टर द बेबी ऑल्सो दे लुक लाइक सेम द स्वेल इन बेबी स्वेल इन प्लेसेंटा एंड ट्राई द थर्ड वन इज अ स्वेल इन मदर and and the biophysical surveillance in the bi- after the uh, simple ultrasound the doppler comes and here we found uh, note the velocity on the uh, middle cerebral artery and uh, if uh, we plot a graph and then we make a zone then you see that the, if the it is um, uh, this uh, Uh, multiple of medians is noted and if it is uh, uh, this against the gestational age and then mca peak velocity so if it is uh, like uh, uh, 1.29 uh, uh, mom then it is a mild anemia and if it is uh, more than uh, uh, 1.5 and more than 1.5 then it is moderate to severe anemia <laughs> and this uh, uh, this even here we can see that this uh, not this is uh, this much and th- this size is this much and it happens actually because there is a uh, like I, uh, we think how can a middle cerebral artery can tell the fetal anemia so because the first of all there is middle cerebral artery is quite close to maternal abdominal wall and it we can uh, see uh, note uh, uh, all the we can feel the its uh, pulsation and secondly because when the uh, there is a, a low fetal uh, um uh, this fetal anemia develops then a fetal heart has uh, in there is a lot of increased cardiac output and the velocity is also increased because of the uh, low viscosity of the uh, blood and so uh, that is why there is a this this we can detect so uh, if it is less than 1.5 then we can wait and do the uh, deliver the patient at 37 weeks and if it is more than 34 weeks uh, and it is more than 1.5 mm better to deliver and if it is less than 34 weeks uh, by mistake it is as written i have written more than but if it is less than 34 weeks then fetal blood sampling is done uh, by a via cordocentesis and if the hematocrit is less than 30% we go for the intrauterine blood transfusion and if the hematocrit is more than 30% then again weekly fetal blood uh, uh, sam- this fetal blood is tested dip- and uh, depending on the again the mca ps and this another one test is the uh, which we uh, regularly private practitioner they don't do but it is amniocentesis and it is a method of choice for detection of rh factor and amniotic fluid uh, bilirubin so cr- the critical uh, titer or the previous uh, indication are the critical titer is there and uh, uh, this uh, middle cerebral artery is actually not a uh, very effective after 35 weeks of pregnancy and we need to see at least two or three values of uh, the uh, to say that this this is going higher and but uh, this when uh, there is a critical titer is there so it is our previous affected then they go for a uh, this amniocentesis and bilirubin obviously correlates with fetal hemolysis and the is facto photometric analysis of the optical density of uh, density of the amniotic fluid is done the, it is at the 450 nm and the data is plotted on a so there mainly three types of a curve and a very common is a lilies curve and uh, which has three zones and it is only generally done at one time only and then mainly in the last trimester and this robertson graph is also there it has 12 zones and the amniocentesis is done at interval at a weekly interval sometime if required and there is a, another is a quinan graph which can be used right from 14 weeks to 40 weeks but we generally because of so much of a, a good uh, ultrasound doppler we uh, need only lily uh, this in lily zone the uh, lower zone or the zone one is safest zone and this we can uh, uh, if the uh, uh, reports is uh, uh, plotting is in this lower zone then you can repeat the amniocentesis every 2 to 4 weeks and you can take the baby till term 
and in the second zone or the middle zone if uh, it needs a uh, this really needs uh, to look after the baby because uh, here if uh, the uh, uh, chances of going to more severity are there and if you act too soon then you can deliver the uh, baby uh, premature so it is very good to prevent prematurity also and if it is the uh, uh, reports are found in the uh, middle zone then you can again wait for one week and again repeat if it is uh, uh, or you can do the fetal blood sampling if it is uh, less than 30 then go for a again intra intrauterine transfusion if it is more than 30 so uh, 30 ka rule zara better hai apna yaad karne ke liye hematocrit karne ke liye or repeat sampling again and then if it is a third zone or uh, uh, is that means baby is severely affected and we need to go for fetal blood sampling and if the fetal hematocrit is found to be uh, around uh, less than 30 then we need to give uh, intrauterine transfusion and if it is more than 30 or uh, 30 then you can again follow and there is a one word about chordocentesis because hematocrit you will take the by the taking blood so uh, but this chordocentesis is a very complicated and very delicate procedure we should not do it only for the diagnostic purpose purpose and if you are doing chordocentesis there should be facility for the intrauterine transfer and transfusion also so and uh, this uh, this uh, is really help the uh, this you can uh, detect the fetal rh phenotype very quickly and it is a gold standard test for detection of the fetal anemia and uh, all the hematocrit value and there is a chances of fetal loss also so but it is not very frequently done and uh, then this uh, comes the intrauterine transfusion something uh, very uh, to be done at uh, really those experts by uh, only but i have never done it i have seen once only so i just but i will just uh, tell you because all uh, i think all the dr parol and all other dr gulati they may be doing it so let 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 me pale talk about then we will take expert opinion of them because all the fetal medicine expert they do it right they lead 4455 uh, transfusion if it is less than hematocrit is less than 30% and the blood is has to be o negative and uh, it is should be fresh and it should be cross matched with the mother's blood and tightly uh, it the rbcs are tightly packed to uh, achieve the hematocrit of uh, 75 to 85% and the, there are mainly uh, two routes intravascular on the intraperitoneal intraperitoneal we was previously used and nowadays it is also used only if you are not able to uh, 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 do the venue puncture of the umbilical vein because or you or your needle is disturbed then then you do the intraperitoneal because the blood uh, uh, that absorption is very very difficult if the baby is a uh, hydrocephalus so it is not preferred so much and among the intravascular it is the umbilical vein at the cord insertion where they do it and when they are doing it actually the uh, two three things are to be uh, uh, remembered how much blood is to be given and what is uh, uh, on, uh, amount of the blood needed for iut it depends on a uh, fetal hematocrit and estimated feto placental blood volume and the hematocrit of the donor blood aur to matlab agar bacche ka kitna hematocrit hai aur jo blood aapka donor laaye agar aap wo bahut acha hai 90 85% hai to usme aapko utna hi kam dena hoga and the uh, fetal placental blood volume is estimated by uh, it is uh, 1.046 plus estimated fetal blood in grams multiplied by 0.14.27 and uh, uh, this thing uh, paralytic agents are given well you must be thinking it is very difficult to go to and puncture this but the all those expert they give the paralytic agent which immediately seizes, uh, moment uh, uh, is uh, seized and they, they they give it and slowly and slowly uh, soon after the iut the ctg is taken and the, the close monitoring is done for the well being of the baby and it should be done under uh, close surveillance uh, surveillance only because uh, looking at the fetal heart also and uh, whether there is any difference and this actually iut what happens aap bahar se de rahe ho or negative blood so wo jo fetal rbc production hai that is suppressed so when you give one or two then they are suppressed and the baby is having a negative blood and uh, chances of this uh, fetal maternal hemorrhages are less and less
एंड देन ये सब हो गया देन देर मैथड ऑफ डिलीवरी सो इतना सब करने के बाद यस यू कैन गो फॉर द वेट फॉर द वेजाइनल डिलीवरी एंड वेजाइनल प्रोस्टाग्लैंडिन जेल कैन बी यूज टू मेक द सर्विक्स राइप इफ द पेशेंट इज एट अराउंड थर्टी सिक्स थर्टी सेवन वीक्स एंड सिजेरियन सेक्शन इज मेनली डन इन दोज केसेस where that immediate termination is to be done and there is a prematurity is there and the unfavorable cervix is there so that is a very uh, safe uh, procedure to go for uh, to just to save the baby and uh, precautions in the vaginal delivery which we are which we must take uh, so that there is a minimum of uh, peto maternal hemorrhage so one is uh, this there is no uh, during labor no fundal pushing in first or the second stage of labor and withhold the injection methergine after anterior shoulder delivery and early cord clamping and no milking and keep the uh, uh, one uh, 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 that uh, practical is uh, approaches keep the cord long because pediatrician and neonatologist will need the cord uh, later on for external blood transfusion also and there no uterine massage or squeeze in the third stage and let the placenta to be delivered spontaneously and, and avoid avoidion of the cord at any uh, uh, cost because sometimes uh, when you are in quick uh, and baby is premature and friable cord hoti hai kai sometimes so it may break so we uh, need to be cautious for that and protect the vaginal and the perineal wound and lacerations from being exposed to the fetal blood spillage and uh, during cesarean the uh, uh, prevent spillage of the blood from placenta into the peritoneal cavity and uh, practically wo do mop laga diya karte the matlab ek side mein aur ek side mein so it wo that, that uh, uh, in, uh, wo mixing and uh, jo bhi spillage hota hai sometimes wo mop ke upar hi aa jata hai and then the spontaneous delivery of the placenta is is advisable and don't do quick quick ki bahut jaldi se karna hai jaldi se band karna hai wo nahi karna hai and is uh, again here also avoid avulsion of the cord and at the birth when the baby is delivered ideally of uh, maternal blood should be tested for the uh, uh, again uh, indirect comb test also but in uh, here the facilities in india are generally uh, not done and this cord blood sample is uh, taken for uh, testing of the di- uh, bl- uh, direct comb test and uh, infant blood group and infant bilirubin and infant hemoglobin and hematocrit level and the dose of the entity is to be cal- cal- to be calculated is a uh, again uh, something for a uh, formula which we need to remember and uh, but only the, the this thing one thing is simple is a 100 microgram of entity neutralizes 4 mg 4 ml of the fetal maternal blood actually hum log to bas ekdam se dete hi hai na ki bas 300 microgram tab dena hai aur 150 tab dena hai bas yahi hai and then this is a clear blood kit test actually what is the principle is the when uh, this blood is a uh, smear is a uh, 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 done with a uh, this uh, ph or acid this uh, this will elute uh, the our uh, uh, red blood cells of the uh, uh, adult hemoglobin but not the fetal hemoglobin and the critical volume is a isoimmunization uh, represented by uh, five uh, fetal cells in 50 low power microscopic field of the peripheral maternal sphere and so 1 ml is represented by 20 fetal cells and this uh, again is a calculation and so see how much is needed and the one thing about the prevention which is very very important uh, how to prevent uh, uh, isoimmunization to so prevent mother for from forming simple sai formula hai ki hame antibody banne banne nahi dena hai to uske liye antigen na pahunche so how will we uh, stop by first thing is by giving this uh, anti d injection and this rh isoimmunization prevention the, is actually the screening we all know ki we will do screening and will do like that and this uh, there is a word for uh, from the dr vincent freda he is a uh, was a uh, that uh, uh, prize uh, award winner uh, very uh, highly renowned uh, uh, doctor and he he was the only one who discovered this uh, anti d uh, actually and uh, his word was ki uh, this rule of thumb is to be uh, noted that administer uh, uh, dose of uh, anti d immunoglobins when in doubt rather than to withhold with withheld it एंड सेकेंड थिंग इज की कम नहीं देना है डोज थोड़ी भी ज्यादा भी चली जाएगी तो इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू हार्म द पेशेंट 
so the antenatal prophylaxis we know the antenatal only 1 to 2% chances of silent bleeds and anti d prophylaxis uh, see i always uh, when i was a student i always used to think ki hum ye rata rata ya 28 weeks pe hi kyon dete hain so anti d prophylaxis is actually effective for 12 weeks so if the injection is recommended at 28 weeks onwards it will take care of the postnatal and all the other antenatal also and the single dose is preferred uh, so many people thinking ki 500 pehle de dein ya itna isko thoda sa bhi de dete hain fir baad mein de denge so that is, instead of that this is a routine antenatal uh, anti d prophylaxis was given and recommended to all non immunized uh, patient and it has decreased risk from 0.9% to 0.3% and as the half life of anti d is around 8 weeks so so many times the few antibodies may be detected at term with so many doctors they get confused and they say ki shayad sensitization hai but very milder form of the indirect wounds test is not very uh, in the patient uh, uh, who has received ntd they may be uh, positive for icd in a very very lower uh, dose so and indi other indications are miscarriages तो इस यहाँ भी बहुत लोगों को थोड़ा सा कंफ्यूजन होता है आई थिंक जो मुझे पता है वो मैंने लिखा है लेटर ऑन ऑल द सीनियर्स दे कैन डिस्कस सो ऑल थेरापेटिक टर्मिनेशन सी माइंड इट इट इज थेरापेटिक ऑल द या सर्जिकल इंटरवेंशन तो रिगार्डलेस ऑफ द जेस्टेशनल एज और मेथड वेदर इट इज अ मेडिकल और अ सर्जिकल यू हैव यू मस्ट गिव एंड ऑल सर्जिकल इवेक्शन ऑल्सो एंड थ्रेटेंड मिस कैरेजेस ऑफ मोर देन ट्वेल्व वीक्स so this word is to be remembered threatened miscarriages more than 12 weeks and threatened miscarriages less than 12 weeks if 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 present with heavy or repeated bleeding or there is a abdominal pain then you give it and all cases of ectopic pregnancy and all the sensitizing uh, events like uh, antepartum hemorrhage fall in mist prenatal diagnosis and all and not indicated in complete spontaneous miscarriages less than 12 weeks it is rcog recommendation but again if so many times uh, i also gave uh, half the dose dei do koi baat nahi and threatened miscarriages less than 12 weeks with a cessation of bleeding before 12 weeks and because that they are uh, thinking that unlikely to cause in uh, significant uh, uh, fmh and postpartum prophylaxis 99% of the women have uh fetal fetal maternal hemorrhages of uh, around 4 ml at, at at the time of delivery 99% and the 500 international unit or 100 microgram will neutralize this and and on how much we are giving we are giving 1500 international unit which will take care of the 15 ml of the फीटो मेटरनल हेमरेज विच इज टू मच मतलब लाइक अगर हम थ्री हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम दे रहे हैं तो हमें कोई चिंता की बात नहीं है सो इट इज क्वाइट एडुकेट इट टाइम इंटरवल इज शुड बी गिवेन लेस देन सेवेंटी टू आवर्स बट इफ मिस्ड कैन बी गिवेन अप टू थर्टीन डेज और इट हैज बीन सजेस्टेड टू गिव इवन विद इन ट्वेंटी एट डेज इफ द पेशेंट कम्स एंड शी हेज नॉट रिसीव इट इज बेटर टू गिव थोड़ा बहुत कुछ भी रह गया हो कि जो बाद में उसका रिस्पॉन्स आ रहा होगा तो मे बी वो उसको न्यूट्रलाइज हो जाए एंड वन अनादर क्वेश्चन सो मेनी पीपल आस दैट इफ एंटीनेटल डोज वॉज गिविंग इन विद इन थ्री वीक्स ऑफ द डिलीवरी दैन लाइक फॉर इफ एनी सेंसिटाइजिंग इवेंट शी रिसीव Mm, uh, this uh, antenatal dose so repeat postpartum dose may be avoided unless there is a uh, chances of large fetal maternal hemorrhage and about the ntd injection nowadays polyclonal uh, uh, injections is uh, universally accepted and the worldwide ob gyn societies are recommending only polyclonal not the monoclonal and the site the site is also very important the route of administration of choice for ntd is a intramuscular route at the deltoid muscles which is very appropriate and safe site to absorption and the uh, gluteal region they say there is a chances of less absorption and so two things to be remembered one is a sensitizing pregnancy first pregnancy is sensitizing pregnancy where the fmh occur and the this weak igm response is there and the first baby is not uh, not uh, affected then the sensitized pregnancy all the subsequent pregnancy as are called sensitized pregnancy and this fmh occurs and there is a, this uh, in, uh, this strong uh, uh, this uh, antibody production and it 
crosses the placenta and it is there and it uh, throughout the life and a fetal cell each and every subsequent pregnancy there are chance more chances of uh, getting worse and worse and of all the uh, fetal so uh, if we are aware of all the this sensitize and sensitizing pregnancy and we know the prophylaxis and we know the screening so there is a positivity swag with the patient also and a doctor also yes koi doubt mat rakhna we can manage negativity thank you thank you thank you very much dr archana verma i think that was an exhaustive and exhausting also i just wonder after 45 minutes how you can just continue speaking like that i have to learn from you requesting all the chair persons jab aapne keh diya tha na jab time hai to bare bare bolo <laughs> requesting the chair persons to please switch on their video and present their own remarks regarding this fantastic exhaustive and long performance ab aaraj negative tha to bolna hi tha na panel main do logon ka talk de rahi thi डॉक्टर नंदिता मैडम का भी मैंने टाइम लिया डॉक्टर अर्चना कैन आई से समथिंग यस मैम मैडम बस कुछ भी बोलिए बट मेरा लाइक वाज अ वंडरफुल टॉक वंडरफुल टॉक यू नो माय सेल्फ एज एन अंडर ग्रेजुएट टीचर एंड अ पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट टीचर आई वुड से इट वाज सो गुड आई थिंक इवन फॉर बिगिनर्स हु are just beginning to learn what is rh and what is sensitization what is isoimmunization you have really said it and presented it in such a simple way that uh, i think if students would have been there they would have really loved it hearing <laughs> and you have really made it so simple really uh, thank you i really much. appreciate you must have really worked hard to make this presentation <laughs> Madam, with beautiful actually, slides have... With beautiful slides, <laughs> ma'am. Actually, I have said earlier, I know. I I always take any subject like me. I don't know. When I don't know anything, I start from zero level. Very good. 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 बुलाटी सर आपका भी चाहिए डॉक्टर बुलाटी इज माय मेंटर मैंने सबसे पहले ग्रेटर नोएडा में जाना शुरू किया था डॉक्टर प्रतीक अगर आपको अगर कभी बहुत अच्छा अपने फेलिस्टेशन कराना है जहां पर भी आपको सबसे अच्छा बेस्ट पॉसिबल फीलिंग आए तो कम टू ग्रेटर नोएडा डॉक्टर अर्चना थैंक यू वेरी मच इज इंडीड वेरी गुड मार्क्स फ्रॉम अ नाइस आफ्टरनून इट वाज वेरी इंस्ट्रक्टिव लेक्चर To revise for another subject, I would just like to add one thing, uh, very very politely, or whatever I know. Checking of hemolysis, hemolytic anemia, has mostly been replaced by the uh, by uh, by the either quadrosynthesis or by studying the cerebral middle cerebral velocity, uh, uh, the flow in the middle cerebral artery, or the velocity. Uh, What is Lily's curve? Except for early gestation, like twenty-six weeks or less, I think it's out. Most likely, I think the, after twenty-six, the answer happens to be uh, uh, either quarter centesis or uh, middle uh, cerebral artery flow. Any comments, ma'am, Doctor Kirti and Doctor Achna, and anybody on the panel? Lily's curve. I think you're right, sir. Curve? in modern medicine now because we have easy access to ultrasound and color doppler and lot of radiologists are also now experienced with color doppler over the past decade most of us have transitioned from doing the age old lily's charts and those curves to looking at the mca psv and getting a prognosis from there you're right there are certain conditions where certain situations i would say where you are practicing in resource poor settings you may not have access easily to color doctor maybe there these lilies charts still have a place but most of us i think more than 90% of us are practicing in situations where ultrasound color doppler and good radiologists are quite easily available most of us have now transitioned to that a very true still doctor in the perinatal oh, sorry i mean of course nowadays i what we believe that lily zone has now become obsolete with the availability of color doppler where we are doing the middle cerebral artery peak velocity and finding out things have become easier to manage 
one or two of them are not very relevant to the topic which is here if i may be permitted then i'll just ask one or two questions to the yes. speaker this is dr lakshmi sen and she is asking in all rh incompatible mothers especially those who are primary gravid should we give rh anti d at 7 month pregnancy actually na abhi to bataya na primary i think prime... probably madam this question has come in when your talk had just started and you had tackled this okay. particular issue of rh prophylaxis towards the end of your talk oh. so maybe the question came in earlier i agree that you had already addressed it and we should be doing it universally we should be giving it at 28 weeks so ha huh, 20 this r a a d p is the name <laughs> absolutely there's another question this is from dr anjana jha and she is asking if the titer is 1 is to 8 at 28 weeks should we give anti d or not no anti d so think... is not given anti d is not given when you are finding is there there are antibodies already and you have to just see whether it is after two, uh, two or four weeks it's raising or not uh, arising or not so thank you for that clear take home message i think some people are still confused whether we should give anti d if the titers are already positive and what should be the flow chart there the titer means antibody is there exactly dr gulati sir had something to add yes sir this is uh, may not be relevant to the topic may not but this is an incident from 45 years ago i was in turn and a lady rh negative was suffered from an abruption accident and was bleeding to hell bleeding to she might have gone off very near death and uh, rh negative blood was just not available it was a hospital in jalanda just not available so a lot of happened we called the pathologist he was also specialized in hematology then we called the physician they didn't know what to do ultimately one great physician he said give with this mother positive blood i'll see what so we all know the primary infusion of our positive blood she will uh, not cause a reaction but that that's a chance we have taken we wait for rh negative but he going to lose his mother how many times more is she requiring will she require blood in her life so that was the practical point taken that give her rh positive let this mother survive if she has got to take rh positive well that's all up later but this is what we decided and stuck in my memory the emergency mother's life is very important very very important and yes. you have to take decisions uh breaking the rules if i can say like that thank you very much i thought i practice in the stone age <laughs> this is much more advanced now yes thank you sir thank, thank you for you. that thank insight you, we have dr uma pandey who has just joined us i think she has taken a break from work so that she could be here and listen to dr archana verma can we request her to please comment uma dr uma I saw her just now briefly while sir was speaking. Doctor Ruchi, आप ही कुछ बोलो. Yeah, Doctor Uma Pandey is back. हाँ, Doctor Uma Pandey कुछ नमस्कार. नमस्कार, Madam जी. नमस्ते, नमस्ते. Please give us your comments since you are working in such a major center. What is the incidence of RHS isoimmunization in your practice, and how do you deal with these patients? in my practice in bhu the uh, incidence of rh immunization is reasonably low and uh, fetal complications are also reasonably low and uh, if at all we see i would say 0.5 to 1% women would have uh, antibody titers positive and i must admit that there are plenty of women on this globe who do not know who were asking question to dr arshana verma whether the women with uh, antibody titers should receive immunization or not there yes, are yes, many people who do not know या बहुत होता है तो तो अगर हमारे आते हैं टाइटर के साथ तो लो टाइटर ही होता है देन वी स्टार्ट विद मिडिल सेरेब्रल आर्टरी मेजरमेंट्स एंड दैट्स द वे वी मॉनिटर देम एंड आई हैव नॉट सीन एनी हाइड्रोपिक बेबी इन माय लाइफ 
uh, or any affected baby. So far, I've been in BHU. I was in as a student here, and then as a faculty, 2011. Not not a single one I've seen. But we do give anti antibody, as Madam Dr. Ashna Verma was saying, that at 28 weeks you must give and postpartum. And most of our women are luckily nowadays they ask themselves, just like the tetanus toxoid women, they ask for, uh, can can we have and can I have NTD at this gestation? So, that, so awareness is very good now, and education level is much. One question, Dr. Tambe. Yes, ma'am. One question: uh, Have you ever seen uh, some anaphylaxis with this antibody? Because I have seen in a patient. Unfortunately, no. I don't think I've ever. This seen has that. been, of course, years back. It must have been about, uh, I think, uh, fifteen, twelve to fifteen years back. And uh, I gave her at around about twenty-eight weeks, and she had anaphylaxis. Of course, uh, we resuscitated her, and she recovered. But uh, that, of course, for that particular two, three years, uh, created such a fear in, in to our residents. That when advised, uh, God knows whether they were giving it or just uh, telling lies that we have already given. There was that became they were really, uh, I mean, very afraid. But gradually and gradually, this was overcome. This is I'm talking of I think 15, 20 years back when Johnson and Johnson had come up with it. So then uh, I have seen one case. So Madam I was just Potter. asking, have have has anybody else also seen? Ma'am, I will. I would like to say that anaphylactic or any adverse reaction can happen even with the milk if they are taking. So milk allergies and food allergies are also being recorded. And oh, any yeah. injection, and especially this is a human immunoglobulin. And so many people say that do take a written consent also. So we should take a consent. Yeah, that is what you advise. Yeah, it is. It is said the you because it is a human immunoglobulin. So, it, uh, a consent should also be taken. Okay. okay. Uh, can I add something? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. He said that consent should always be taken when we are given uh, this entity to the patient for a reason because it's a blood Hello. product. So, whenever we are Hello. giving any kind of a blood product to the patient, we always have to take the consent. Hello? The uh, deltoid is the finest place or the best place to give consent injection and uh, when we give this injection if the titer is done later on on a later date the titer comes out to be one is to four that's that is absolutely normal because the they do not have to be concerned that the patient is uh, like uh, something is some problem has occurred to the patient it can be one is to four on a later time also on a later date after giving yeah. this injection. thank you ma'am yes, i think we've had hard... yes ma'am please go ahead yeah, this is a very valid point. After giving NTD injections at 28 weeks, when you go for ICT within four weeks, the titer comes out to be positive. At times, one is to two, one is to four. So, Abhi, so like, like I've already told, the half-life, yes, uh, Priyanka, the half-life of NTD is eight weeks. So, if you put injection after injection, it will come in positive mild. Mein. So, ma'am, but it generates a lot of panic. So, this message is clear. Everyone should know that the titer should be... That panic has not yet been finished. IgG positive, 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 so I think we've had a very exhaustive and thorough discussion. We'd like to place on record a gratitude to all the chairpersons. And yes. if there are thank any closing you, remarks... Thank you, Dr. Chutil. If there are any closing remarks from the chairpersons, we would welcome them. Or then we can proceed with the panel. Anybody Dr. Arunayak and would like Dr. Dr. Chalega and Dr. Kirti Madam uh, is here and Dr. Uh, Khurana, is, I think she could. And I think Dr. Uma Pandey is busy with her green tea, so she uh, won't like to speak. <laughs> then I smart or uh, Banaras Wali? I would like to explain, I banana sola chani green. Dr. Priyanka, to, just to explain to everybody why it is given in Delta, is, is Dr. Priyanka said, this, isn't it? Yes. You said that. The absorption is best. Yes. Absorption is faulty in the gluteal. What happens with the gluteal? See, in, uh, the, the amount, when you give it in the gluteal region, there's a lot of amount of fat in that region. So, yes. exactly the absorption, the blood supply of fat is very poor. As a result, the absorption is very, very faulty in the gluteal region. That's correct. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absorption. That's very important information. 
and uh, every center should have this kind of a protocol that if they have a baby baby who is affected by uh, and uh, recess uh, iso immunization where they would refer what is the protocol and how would the baby come back to them to their nipu i think that's quite relevant and ma'am kirti ma'am would agree to me at in merit we have seen cases which have come to be icit positives like in banaras i think the immuno prophylaxis is very good but merit madam we have seen high drops also as well of course of course we have seen so that's so why i think this underlines that prevention is the best strategy and prevention is always better than cure having said that dr archana has exhaustively covered all the therapeutic options as well thank you very much dr archana ma'am for that fantastic lecture and to all the esteemed chairpersons we would like to now proceed with the panel discussion since we it's already 3:15 pm one hour ho gaya rhi immunization aapka fantastic <laughs> Back end team, can we have the CV slides, please, so that we can introduce the panelists? So at the outset, I'd like to welcome everybody to the panel. This is a simple, straightforward panel on a gynec topic, which is first trimester bleeding. All of us encounter this almost daily in our OPD practice, and we thank all the panelists for accepting our invitation to introduce them. First, we have Dr. Archana Mehta. She is a professor at SMS and R Greater Noida in UP. She is the vice president of the Greater Noida OBGYN Society. She has several publications in national and international journals, and her areas of interest include high-risk pregnancy and adolescent health. Next slide, please. We also have with us Dr. Madhulika Mohan Sahai. She is a senior consulting OBGYN at Shiva Polyclinic and Endoscopy Center. Past president of the Varanasi OBGYN Society, past vice president of the Varanasi IMA. She has held various positions in the Varanasi OBGYN Society and IMA Varanasi. She is somebody who has several areas of interest, including fetal medicine, high-risk pregnancy, ultrasound, and preventive oncology. Welcome, Dr. Madhulika Sahab. Next slide, please. We are also privileged to have with us Dr. Monica Singh Tomar. She is presently holding the post of Finance Secretary of the Women's Doctors Wing of IMA Merit. She is part of the executive body of the Merit OBGYN Society, also the Scientific Secretary for the IMA Merit branch. Previously, she has worked as a gynecological consultant at the Triveni Sugar Mill in Katoli. Way back, she is head of department. at nangli charitable hospital consultant gynecologist at km hospital since 2003 and we welcome madam thank you so much for joining us next slide please dr madhulika singh is a senior consultant gynecologist hysteroscopist and lab surgeon at shivam hospital in varanasi she is the secretary of the varanasi obgyn society past treasurer of the same society an active consultant in psi and project coordinator for sipsa she is an ex consultant at several hospitals active member of the varanasi society and she has special interest in infertility management hysteroscopy endosurgery laparoscopy and colposcopy we thank madam for joining us next slide please dr priyanka garg is the current secretary of the merit obgyn society she has done her mbbs from sms medical college in jaipur she has been awarded the gold medal for standing first in mbbs in rajasthan state she is ms from llrm medical college in merit has been awarded the usha sharma running one second i can't read that because of the yes running cup in ms and she has a fellowship in laparoscopic gynec surgery from sunrise hospital kochi more than 10 years of experience as an undergraduate and postgraduate teacher numerous publications and presentations to her credit she has won many awards including the cs don gold medal and her field of interest is minimal access gynecological surgery next slide please dr ruchi shrivastav is the professor and co-chairperson of the board of studies in obgyn at sharda medical college in greater noida she is the founder and secretary of the greater noida obgyn society a fellow of the icog and an advisor to the menstrual disorders committee of the society of menstrual disorders and hygiene management welcome dr ruchi shrivastav next slide please dr sachin dalal is a dear friend from the mumbai obgyn society <laughs> 
He's a consultant gynecologist and IVF specialist at Madhu Hospital in Bandup in Mumbai. He also is attached to the Embryon IVF Center in Vikroli West in Mumbai. And it's something which he should be rightly proud of because it's one of the pioneering institutions in IVF in that particular territory. Welcome, Dr. Sachindalal. Next slide, please. Dr. Rekha Rajesh is from Hosur and she has a diploma in reproductive medicine from Germany, also a postgraduate diploma from London. She is a fellow of the ICOG, diploma in cosmetic gynecology from American Aesthetic Association, master's certificate in reproductive medicine from Homerton University. She is trained in embryology as well and she has also several accomplishments in gynec endoscopy to her credit. She is the Joint Secretary of IMA Hosur and she is the current Secretary of the Krishna Giri Upichivan Society. Welcome Dr. Ekha Rajesh. So if I may be permitted to share my slides, we can start with the panel and this is going to be a simple straightforward panel requesting all the panelists to keep their audio and video on and We'll direct the questions to everybody in turn and once that person has finished speaking, then the rest of you will be invited to give your opinions. You can raise your hand and then you'll be given a chance to speak. If we can advance the slide. Yes, it's now advancing. So this is a simple straightforward panel on first trimester bleeding. Welcome to all the panelists. I like to start with quotations and today's quotation is from the American author Noam Chomsky. And he said once upon a time that a willingness to be puzzled is a valuable trait to cultivate from childhood to advanced inquiry. I think it's particularly pertinent to today's topic because we are talking about first trimester bleeding. Just like acute abdomen is like a Pandora's box which may present with multiple presentations for a general surgeon. I think acute bleeding which comes in OBGYN is a similar presentation if I may say and that can actually masquerade for several pathologies which may be present. So let's start with the basic and very simple questions to get all our panelists warmed up. And if you remember, if you remember both your undergraduate and your postgraduate texts like Novak, like Jeff Court, there are several confusing terminologies that we have. And these confusing terminologies make our life very difficult because some of them overlap some of them keep being changed and then because of the diagnosis being changed obviously our treatment also needs to change so let's start by asking dr archana mehta ma'am what is this early pregnancy loss um, thank you sir for the question you know this uh, we have to know that human reproduction is surprisingly very inefficient and uh, wasteful process so this uh, traditionally the pregnancy loss uh, is the spontaneous demise of pregnancy and uh, in pre modern uh, 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 ultrasound era we were using clinical findings to uh, divide it into different types basically now we have to know that pregnancy loss which is early pregnancy loss is basically spontaneous you try and demi uh, uh, spontaneous uh, pregnancy demise it can be a non visualized pregnancy loss or it can be miscarriage which is occurring before 10 weeks of pregnancy so uh, previously we used to say that pregnancy loss can be divided into early and late early means first trimester and late means second trimester but now we know that the embryogenesis is complete by 9 to 10 weeks so this uh, division into early pregnancy loss in 12 weeks and late pregnancy loss after 12 weeks it makes no sense because it is neither based on ultrasound finding nor on biological process so now we say that early pregnancy loss should include pregnancy loss which is occurring before 10 weeks of pregnancy and it should include also non visualized pregnancy loss which includes biochemical pregnancy loss and pregnancy of unknown location so and we'll come to that in just a couple of minutes thank you so much ma'am okay. for elaborating on early pregnancy loss We'll come to some more technical terms which have come to us with the advent of ultrasound. Now, in the 70s and 80s, when ultrasound was not easily available, probably early pregnancy loss was the dominant term in most of our medical texts, as some of the old-timers will remember. But with the advent of ultrasound, 
good high resolution probes and the ubiquitous availability of radiologists who are trained in ultrasound we have now come to some more terms which are more commonly seen in our textbooks like an embryonic pregnancy i would like to invite dr madhulika sahay ma'am to please tell us what is this an embryonic pregnancy ye kya hota hai thank you dr prati an embryonic pregnancy in this modern era of uh, ultrasound scanning this is defined as when the uh, there is pregnancy intrauterine pregnancy and the gestation sac mean sac gestation sac diameter is uh, above 25 mm but there is no embryo, uh, fetal pore then it is called as an embryonic pregnancy and this is an embryonic and also other definition if ultrasound scan was done beforehand and we repeat the in which the gestation sac and the uh, yolk sac were available were visible but after repeating the scan after 11 days there is no uh, embryonic pole with fetal heart then it is also uh, no this is the uh, uh, sorry this is for uh, diagnosing non viable pregnancy the an embryonic is the same thing when there is gestation sac but there is no fetal pole at uh, 25 mm of mean gestation sac diameter so i think many of these terminologies confuse us even today even i have to sometimes look up textbooks and recent advances and articles which are what we call them review articles to understand and refresh my memory and i've put up one such review article definition here and i've marked out the important definitions with red boxes let's go through these together so that both of us i mean all of us have some clear idea in our mind what we are going to be discussing a little while later so an embryonic gestation is when a ultrasound shows a gestation sac with a mean diameter of more than 25 mm but there is no yolk sac or embryo and that's what traditionally we used to call an an embryonic pregnancy usually this is because of chromosomal issues or major aneuploidies and therefore the development is arrested at a very early stage early pregnancy loss is a non viable intrauterine pregnancy and every term here is important it's non viable intrauterine pregnancy within the first 13 weeks and in contradistinction to that a late pregnancy loss would be after 13 weeks in the second or third trimester an embryonic demise is when ultrasound shows an embryo with a crl of 7 mm or more but there is no cardiac activity this is the most common presentation of what today we call a missed abortion or a missed miscarriage crl is 7 mm or more there's a regular g sac but the cardiac activity is not seen and typically these patients we will call back again for a repeat scan after 10 days or 15 days and ideally we would like to refer these patients maybe to a radiologist for a second opinion somebody just remarked about pregnancy of unknown location and pregnancy of uncertain viability we will be discussing these in a little more detail throughout the rest of the panel now that everybody is warmed up let's just address the other important issue which all of us should be aware often we don't do our own scans and if we don't do our own ultrasound scans we outsource them to either a gynecologist or an obstetrician who is experienced in ultrasound and is certified or to a radiologist we should be able to read between the lines and we should be able to understand what these findings translate into so what are the ultrasound criteria which are suggestive of a pregnancy loss dr priyanka garg madam see as we all know in the early ultrasound we see for a gestational sac look for a yolk sac and then embryo from where crown lamp length is measured so first of all normally we should know what is a normal scan so usually we get a scan done at 6 weeks we do not get it by 4 to 5 weeks but still if we need some kind of confirmation at 5 weeks a gestational sac is visible and at between 5 to 6 weeks we can see the yolk sacs and at 6 weeks of gestation the embryo is visible cardiac activity varies between 6 to 7 weeks of pregnancy we wanted to discuss early pregnancy loss as well or the normal findings dr yes, sam please go ahead sorry 
yeah. i got a message and i got distracted please go ahead okay. so uh, we what we are concerned here is ki when do we are, when do we feel suspicious about early pregnancy loss as already has been described that once you see a gestational sac which is a diameter of about 24 mm and you are not able to see the embryo then something should hit your mind that this pregnancy is not doing well so absence of embryo with cardiac activity 7 to 13 days after ultrasonography shows gestational sac without yolk sac or small gestational sac which is relative to the size of okay there is a disparity between the size of gestational sac and the embryo then also we can think of an early pregnancy loss plus yolk sac once you have an enlarged yolk sac this is very very important a finding the gestational sac and yolk sac should be in proportional such that the yolk sac is about 1/3 of the size of gestational sac so if we find that the yolk sac is very enlarged greater than 7 mm in early pregnancy at around 5 weeks of gestation this is also an abnormal finding plus as dr tambe has already told us that if in a fetus with a crown rump length greater than 7 mm you are not able to see a cardiac activity then this is almost definitive of an early pregnancy loss or absence of embryo in a pregnancy greater than 6 weeks after the confirm confirming the last menstrual period at times in overdue cycles we have to give a waiver for this and we have to re repeat the scan after 7 to 10 days also an empty amnion seen adjacent to the yolk sac with no visible embryo or embryonic heartbeat which is less than 85 beats per minute so usually what we do the sonologist start reporting after 120 or 110 bradycardia at 110 at 90 no bradycardia is only when the heartbeat is less than 85 beats per minute thank you ma'am i think that was exhaustive and i have put up this table here just for everybody's knowledge obviously none of us is going to remember all of these criteria by heart and that's why i thought it is important to focus on that last column for ultrasound findings which are diagnostic of early pregnancy loss if you have a sac diameter of 25 mm or more with no embryo or cardiac activity which is not seen two weeks after previously an ultrasound has showed a gestation sac without yolk sac and as madam also pointed out absence of embryo with cardiac activity 11 days or more after ultrasound has shown g sac and yolk sac sometimes you'll see radiologists will report these findings which are diagnostic of early pregnancy loss but still they will say okay repeat ultrasound after one week it is up to us as obstetricians to know where to repeat the ultrasound and where these patients will have change in findings after 10 days or 11 days and that is for the central column where findings are only suspicious for early pregnancy loss if so the findings are already think... diagnostic then probably there's not much time much to be gained by waiting for another 10 11 days and repeating the scan yes ma'am may i interrupt and ask yeah, something yeah 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 sir would you like to add on beta hcg in these cases yeah beta we'll come HCG to beta hcg in an exhaustive okay. discussion okay. and we will come to that in one okay. of the cases i thought we should start by talking about ultrasound and definitions because many of us are not aware of the modern terminology that's one point and the second point is that many of us don't do our own ultrasound scans and we sometimes are led astray by that last column of diagnosis in what the radiologist has written sometimes the radiologist we refer to will not write an exhaustive detailed description like you see in this table they'll just give us the take home message and sometimes we are led astray by that so it's important to know all the different definitions which are now being described in the textbooks now that we have a good foundation let's go to the individual cases and if dr monika tomar and dr ruchi shrivastava are there then we would like to discuss this first case with them initially this is a lady who is 32 years old she is presented in accident and emergency she is married since 2 years last menstrual period was 8 weeks ago has had irregular cycles once every 2 to 2 and a half months weight was 75 kilos after some diet and exercise she has lost 10 kgs at 8 weeks she is reporting cramping pelvic pain 
We did an emergency ultrasound. There's six weeks intrauterine sac, cardiac activity is present, but unfortunately there is a 1.5 by 1 centimeter size subchorionic hematoma, which is a significantly large hematoma at six weeks. What advice do you think we should be offering her, Dr. Monica Tomar and Dr. Ruchi Srivastava? Yes, sir. So this lady is six weeks pregnant with an intrauterine viable pregnancy, and here we discover that she has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, her menstrual history is uh, suggesting that there is there might be some PCOD element. She was obese initially. She's lost 10 kg weight, which might have increased her fertility. Now, past uh, PCOD is a high risk factor again for recurrent pregnancy loss. Weight loss has in, might have increased her uh, fertility, and it is again an optimistic sign. Here, I would like to give a guarded reassurance. To this lady, and I would like her to uh, have a watchful waiting. As so, should we admit this lady? She has a subchorionic hematoma. The important question that she asks is, Doctor, do I need to be admitted or can I take this treatment at home? So, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, depends on the actually size of the hemorrhage. If it is a small one, uh, generally, uh, patient may be ambulatory, we can just send her home. Being a PCOD, I think I would like to give her some progestation agent. I would like, uh, can advise her a bed rest at home only. Though bed rest does not uh, seem to really alter the outcome. Subarachnoid actually is quite innocuous sort of a problem. If the size is small and it is not increasing subsequent ultrasounds. Only if the ultrasounds or hematoma increases, then I can uh, uh, worry about the patient because it might set off a domino effect and might cause rupture of the membranes, but otherwise um, no, there will be just more expectancy and a guarded reassurance to her. Bus. Dr. Ruchi Srivastava, madam, I think I saw you raising your hand. Would you like to say something? Separation of the chorion membrane from the lining. And it is... Or the treatment of the patient is taken on the type of the hematoma it is. Like the severity, the size, the location. This particular patient of ours, the size is already too much. Because at six weeks, uh, if uh, it is said that if the hematoma size is more than or equal to 25% size of the gestational sac, then the chances of abortions are very, very high. So in this particular case, the size of the hematoma is like uh, you said about, it was six weeks, right, sir? Yes, so ma'am, it's six weeks. And the key factor here is that it is not corresponding to her LMP. LMP is eight weeks, but... Yeah, size so on ultrasound is only six weeks. Six weeks, and at six weeks, the gestational sac is around fourteen millimeters, yeah. and uh, the size of the uh, hematoma is also is a uh, equally uh, like it is e almost equal to this gestational sac. So there are very high chances that uh, it, she is going to have a bad prognosis, and in that case, I would like to admit this patient under my uh, observation and would definitely go in for the other treatment as well like the progesterone therapy will definitely go in for that the micronized progesterones and uh, definitely we advise every patient the bed rest though it has no role and it is not going to help in any way but it is commonly recommended by everyone that you have to go in for this uh, secondly, Ashna ma'am very rightly said that Arish negative, we were just doing this lecture earlier. So if we have to find out her blood group as, as well, if she is Arish negative, then we have to be in this case. Thank you, ma'am. Sachin, I'm going to bring you into the discussion. We IVF specialists are very much maligned for prescribing progesterone left, right and center, sometimes in unindicated cases. But do you think this woman who has a threatened miscarriage in a setting of PCOS where she has a subchorionic hematoma, this is very much a valid indication for progesterone? Let's see. Yes, Pratik, first of all, thank you very much for having me on this panel and, uh, and a very esteemed panel with senior doctors and probably amongst the junior most here. Uh, regarding your question, uh, she is classic obese PCOS. Uh, there is a possibility of having a luteal phase deficit also a luteal phase defect and you said that there is a, a gap between the gestational age as well as the sonography age uh, that is mostly because of PCO there is uh, 
delayed period so we will see the the gap uh, in comparison to how uh, we calculate uh, on 28 weeks to 30 uh, 28 to 30 days uh, a monthly period visa vis a delayed period so that won't really be a concern uh, secondly as uh, dr ruchi shrivastava rightly mentioned it is actually a very big hematoma compared to the size of the gestational sac uh, admission if uh, she uh, feels that she will be safer in the hospital only then probably i'll admit her right now being covid i probably would not want to unnecessarily give any admissions in the hospital and you know what i'll just give share a small trick here when you tell the mother in law that this woman requires bed rest uh, she actually genuinely gets bed rest at home so progesterone bed rest and home confinement i think should do the trick so can you tell us what is the reason progesterone seems to work in threatened miscarriage what is the biochemical basis for this progesterone is it that indian women are deficient in progesterone in the last 10 15 years because all the pharma companies want us to push progesterone pills down our patients throats uh, not no not really not really i think uh, the luteal phase defect is actually a concern which is uh, we are seeing uh, of course pcos and on the other uh, end low amh both of these cases are definitely on the rise probably because of the stress mobile usage uh, plastic usage i mean we have the entire risk with us so this probably causes a strong lpd and that needs to be tackled with a good progesterone support till 12 to 13 weeks of pregnancy okay sir, thank you yeah sir one uh sir one important action of progesterone is that it is also immunomodulating yes it is required for the uh, implantation because it causes secretory changes in the endometrium Very which good. are required for implantation and maintenance of pregnancy Very and the second important action is immunomodulation you know fetus is semi allograft means half is self half is non self so uh, there are some maternal immunological changes Uh, which is caused by this progesterone because it causes secretion of progesterone inducing blocking agent bif factor which is required for the shifting of the this uh, th helper 1 to th helper 2 cells which are important for the maintenance of pregnancy so that is why i think uh, progesterone has definitely role and especially for this patient it it is going to help Thank you, thank you very much, ma'am. I'll just quickly summarize what the evidence says. As far as subcoronic bleeds and miscarriage risk is concerned, there is a big meta-analysis which was published in 2019. More than 2,000 women over three years were followed up. 451 had subcoronic hematomas, and they found from an independent meta-analysis that the presence and size of the hematoma was not really directly proportional to pregnancy loss. but whenever you have such a large hematoma which is happening at such an early gestational age then maximum precautions need to be taken whether or not we admit the patient is up for a toss considering that now we are in a covid era where we would like to minimize patient admissions but yes progesterone may definitely help because it's an essential hormone regarding the question of whether women in india have suddenly become deficient in progesterone over the past couple of decades and why we are supplementing it as rightly pointed out progesterone is supposed to be required at different stages of embryo implantation and continuation of the pregnancy it also induces something called as pibf or progesterone induced clotting factor and is responsible for maintaining the balance towards pro embryonic continuation rather than phagocytosing the embryo which is what th1 does and if you have good increase pibf there is healthy growing pregnancy there is something called as embryo protective immunomodulation which happens and this is well known from several studies and research work let's go to the next case this is a 35 year old lady she is married since 4 years she tried infertility treatment but discontinued because it was not yielding any results then she conceived spontaneously now she is presented with abdominal pain and bleeding per vaginum ultrasound has shown a 7 weeks intrauterine pregnancy but cardiac activity is unfortunately absent the g sac is irregular internal loss is also now open uh, is dr rekha rajesh there i don't think i see her so then we'll go to dr madhulika sahay madam what do you think is wrong with this lady and what management options would you offer her 
oh this lady is th- uh, 35 years and uh, she has conceived of infertility treatment as you have told in this case unfortunately she has got the uh, absent fetal cardiac activity so my management first of all seeing the uh, this uh, this is a important precious issue but uh, because there is no fetal cardiac activity and it is 7 weeks so i may first i will terminate the pregnancy either by medical means or by uh, surgical methods my first choice will be medical uh, the use of mesoprostol so by use of mesoprostol i will give uh, either 800 uh, microgram sub uh, uh, intravaginally or 600 mg microgram sub sublingually in this way and then i uh, follow up ultrasound to detect the uh, uh, whether the abortion has been completed or not this will be my first line of action and then i will uh, like to give the patient the um, preconceptional counseling for further future pregnancy because she is elderly uh, primary and she has conceived after infertility treatment so proper counseling i will do because patient will be very much in stress and for pre conceptional uh, counseling uh, modifying her lifestyle changes reducing weight gain and uh, uh, this taking uh, if there is any uh, adverse activity or like alcohol consumption or smoking this also should be counseled to avoid uh, further any uh, problem and then we will do certain test certain these are Uh, uh, i suppose all the tests must have been done because she was elderly but still so a few tests will be repeated her th- uh, this uh, routine test thyroid activity her bmi all the, uh, i will co- uh, check and counsel for all these things and what next um, ha huh. so, uh, the the things uh, whether the product of conception should be uh, taken for this uh, uh, karyotyping this in one abortion this is not important but it uh, we can individualize because she is elderly she might be very much in stress conception for further counseling either it is a balanced uh, translocation or it is a um, this uh, 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 maybe an endocardy or triploid tri- absolutely yeah. thank you so much ma'am i think you've covered a lot of ground there I just like to open this for discussion to the entire panel. Does anybody else want to wait and watch and repeat a scan after one week? I'll just go back to the previous slide to show you the ultrasound findings, because this is a patient who is conceived after a lot of treatment has failed, and often these patients are going from pillar to post to get a confirmation: is this baby really dead? Is there any even one percent chance that this can continue? and often we are helpless we have to tell them the truth we have to tell them that probably this will not grow but is there any case for you waiting and repeating the scan after one week no anybody sir, on the panel yeah yes ma'am i think she requires prompt attention uh, uh, it's a case clear cut case of embryonic demise the internal loss is open gestation sac is irregular but yes in today's scenario like we get so many litigations and a lot of patients you know they become hostile and they might think that i have not tried enough in that case i would like to send her over for a second opinion to my colleague or i will ask her for a telephonic consultation with you or uh, uh, archana ma'am anybody so that just to pacify the patient so, uh, such patients who have conceived after long and that to a spontaneous conception it they might be in too much of distress hearing about the fetal demise it they might not digest it they'll go into a denial phase whenever you break such a sad news many patients they tend to go into a denial phase no it cannot happen with me maybe may, doctor are you sure uh, can, uh, send me to doctor kirti dubey she's your teacher she uh, she might guide me better or try something else try the costliest medicine give me uh, any injection uh, just for patient satisfaction yes. i would like to send her for a second opinion if i on counseling or talking to her if i feel that she is not satisfied with what i am telling or she is not ready to uh, accept the negative uh, report dr sachin dalal is Otherwise, raising his hand yes sir know, please go ahead in heart of heart i know she needs a prompt attention to terminate the pregnancy yeah 
But even yes, then, Edwin. if yeah. he's not satisfied, I would like to stay. Yeah, Pratik. So uh, we all come across such situations in day-to-day -day life. Uh, looking at her profile, I would not straight away go and abort the patient because she is definitely uh, conceived and uh, having anxiety about it. So what I normally do in such patients is do a serial beta HCG. If the serial beta HCG is growing, then definitely it's a viable pregnancy and it makes sense to make the patient wait for one week or 10 days or 15 days, whatever is the individual as a central protocol for uh, checking out for viability. And in 48 hours, if the beta HCG is falling or if it is static, then it's a sure, sure thing that it is a non-viable pregnancy. And when you have a laboratory documentation of the same, the patients are much more uh, trusting in us that yes, that is what actually the condition is. And uh, then I would probably uh, go ahead and give a medical abortion. Secondly, the patient always expects for us to prescribe some medicines. So these are the patients whom I would say that I'm giving you progesterone. I will always give an oral progesterone. In this case, probably an injectable uh, progesterone just to support it. Never a vaginal progesterone in such a cases because she is having bleeding and an open internal loss. And uh, just buy time for three or four days till the time the beta HCG reports are in. Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. I think this underlines the importance of individualizing the treatment to the patient that is there across the table. Though in practice, we know if the internal loss is already open and the sac has already become irregular, the chance is quite high that she will miscarry spontaneously within the next few days. It may be worthwhile to do a serum beta HCG. I think Dr. Priyanka Gar was talking about it earlier. And then maybe repeat it after 48 hours, see whether the values are falling, document that clearly so that tomorrow the patient also has a clear-cut documentary evidence that this was a non-viable pregnancy which was not going to continue. It was not mistakenly terminated. I am using the word mistaken in inverted comma because many patients feel that our treatment may be inappropriate. And therefore, clear-cut documentation, especially in these patients who may be emotionally labile or they may be misguided sometimes by other people also. Sometimes we have friends, relatives, mm -hmm. even sometimes our own colleagues. You know, God forbid, I don't want to defame anybody. But sometimes our own colleagues and we ourselves may be guilty of doing that inadvertently. Not knowingly, but inadvertently. This doctor has done wrong treatment. Kiya. It's something which happens in a reflex fashion, like a knee-jerk response. But we should try and avoid that. Have clear-cut documentary evidence, whether it's a repeat scan, which is done by a radiologist from an independent place, not somebody who's attached to your own hospital, or you can do a falling beta HCG titer as a documentation. Both of these options are there. Coming to the question of whether we do a karyotyping or not, we know that aneuploidies are more common at the age of 35 and aneuploidies are the most common causes of first trimester losses. Yes, Sachin, I see you raising your hand. Yeah, regarding karyotyping Pratik, I mean, yeah. I've seen in initial days of my practice, when in such a uh, scenario, I used to send for karyotyping. Now, it clearly mentions that there is no yolk sac, there is no fetal pole. So it's mostly an MN, an embryonic or what we commonly call Correct. as a blighted ovum. Yes. When we send this for karyotyping, we will not get a proper uh, True. Uh, report. So, you know, True. rather than, uh, I would strongly suggest to send for karyotyping only when a fetal pole is strongly documented. When because otherwise it's just a chest is documented. Yes, you're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. But, sir, so here again, yes, karyotyping should be done actually. Not in this case. But in cases of BOH, in, whenever you feel like, like we said, ki we are doing beta HCG just to prove that we are correct. So karyotyping and we do microarrays now. Karyotyping has gone beyond that. So we go for microarrays and it is for around, uh, it is expensive, around 7,500 to 8,000. But it is a very good documentary evidence of aneuploidies. And then you can at least have it. We have a cause as well, which has been ascertained. So True. if the patient is affordable, we should go for a karyotyping. So once you've counseled your patient and they've indicated that, yes, they want to investigate further and do the best possible tests and document everything so that next time they are going to proceed in a proper fashion as was rightly pointed out with all the pre-pregnancy counseling and everything in that setting maybe there is some point in doing a karyotyping even for a first 
pregnancy loss usually we reserve it for multiple losses like two or three losses we know that incidence of trisomy 21 is highest and peaks around the age of 35 or so and you can see that this is the same chart which i used to counsel my own patients which shows that significantly increased incidence after the age of 35 onwards as far as evacuation is concerned we have two options surgical as well as medical and usually surgical evacuation is what we used to prefer in the good old days i think today now we prefer medical evacuation to try and avoid surgical curettage to try and avoid intrauterine adhesions which may result after you do a curettage and of course you will see that these are the prescribed alternatives mifepristone 200 plus mesoprostol 800 or you can give mesoprostol alone comparing these two regimens i want to ask the panel what is your experience does mesoprostol alone complete the job in most of your patients yes sachin i uh, know pratik in majority of the cases initially we used to give only mesoprostol when the os used to be open uh, but in these cases the rpoc insistence used to be very high what mifepristone does nightly uh, is just cuts off the progesterone supply completely and mesoprostol pushes the pregnancy out so a combination of mife plus miso gives an excellent result second uh, modification that i have uh, seen and uh, done since the last almost uh, 12 to 15 years is giving a single shot of misoprostol 800 mg causes some side effects in the patient like you will have shivering and fever and vomiting etc etc yes right so uh, instead of that if uh, you are giving uh, mife plus ton on day 1 and miso 400 sublingual on day 3 and day 4 that works wonders and we are able to achieve almost a 97% evacuation rate uh, up to 8 to 9 weeks of pregnancy true so if your patient especially has been on progesterone support or various other supports if she is somebody who has been taking art treatment for example she will already be on a lot of what we call masala and that masala sometimes prevents the mesoprostol from working you give it in good faith saying that kam goli hai do hi goli khania padega theek ho jayega ek hi time pe sab nikal jayega but that doesn't happen if you have patients who are on good luteal phase support or if they have been taking art treatment then probably you need to resort to both mifepristone and mesoprostol you can see here that the success rates are significantly higher and the incidence of requiring a check curettage is much lower a check curettage or a dilatation and evacuation in the year 2020 all of us should be trying to avoid as much as possible especially in the light of an infertile patient because you don't want to give her another cause for not conceiving which often is the case let's go to the next case this is a 35 year old lady she's conceived with ivf beta hcg levels have been monitored in the immediate aftermath they have shown an exponential rise over time at 6 weeks you saw on ultrasound that there were two intrauterine sacs cardiac activity was present and one week later at 7 weeks she is presented with bleeding per vaginum irregularly somebody who has not spoken so far dr ruchi shrivastava ma'am would you like to comment on this uh, yes sir uh, with the ivf uh, it's they you these patients usually experience a uh, lot of spotting and vaginal bleeding in the first trimester and uh, 50% of those patients who bleed in the first trimester with ivf they mostly uh, continue the pregnancy well later on so this is a twin pregnancy now but uh, now there are many reasons for this uh, bleeding in the first trimester with ivf the one of the reason is the implantation bleeding and uh, with the twin pregnancy this is on a higher side because when the embryo implants in the lining so it tends to trigger the hormones and which tends to bleed the uterus tends to bleed so we do not have to go into the uh, we do not uh, we have to counsel the patient right away if it would have been a natural singleton or a twin pregnancy then the chances for miscarriage would be a little higher because this is an ivf pregnancy and it is a twin so the chances becomes little lesser and the continuation of the pregnancy is very good in these cases um, if she is irregularly bleeding we definitely go in for the management for these patients and that too is a conservative management in these cases Uh, we also have to get the ultrasound done that is the tvs we have to assess for the 
length of the cervix the internal loss diameter if we feel that the length is decreasing in a decreasing trend uh, definitely i am going to start up with the progesterone therapy in these patients and uh, along with that uh, we can go in for the uh, encircle arch operations in these cases so we'll come uh, to that in just a couple of minutes a very good point that you made ma'am is that even though the scan is done just one week ago always repeat the scan if we are if we are in a non covid era probably we would admit this patient because these patients are very hyper kind of patients and there's a lot of pressure from the colleagues from the relatives as well to do something probably since she is an ivf pregnancy she is already on a lot of progesterone and support but maybe sometimes it's worthwhile switching over to an intramuscular progesterone to ensure that there is good drug delivery in these patients so now you've repeated an ultrasound and you're presented with this kind of picture at 7 weeks it's vastly different from what you saw at 6 weeks what is the problem here anybody dr priyanka gar would you like to comment you repeated a scan at 7 weeks at 6 weeks there was twins at 7 weeks she's come with bleeding and now there are three sacs can you count there are three sacs in the picture okay, yeah. okay so why is this maybe uh, we had missed this sac earlier actually this must be a triplet pregnancy only correct at that time they must have missed it at that time that is the only thing yes so the reason why she has come with bleeding is because you can see in two sacs there is good cardiac activity and growth i can't demonstrate cardiac activity because it's not a video but the third sac only shows a yolk sac you can't see the fetal pole very clearly if it was a video i would move the probe around to show you that entire g sac completely and probably that is an an embryonic pregnancy it's not continuing okay so this is the reason why she is presented with bleeding since there are three and one is not growing now we are in a soup we might end up losing all three of them sachin what would you do in this case uh, pratik basically in such a cases i mean this is a very common thing uh, especially when we are putting unfortunately than... it's very common and the message here that all of us want to convey everybody on this panel is that we should be putting in one or two embryos maximum Absolutely. do right. not buy pregnancy and success at any cost because you will land up in a major soup and if you are unfortunate this patient may go somewhere else they may not know the history geography what has happened during her ivf cycle how many embryos have been replaced but i'm sorry i interrupted you please go ahead no no so i mean this happens time and again we are seeing when some of our colleagues put in more than 2 3 4 5 6 jitne embryos bane utne dal do so you know that uh, mindset should change we should stick to not more than two blastocysts or in case if it's a cleavage cell then not more than three cleavage cell though our limit is two uh, since uh, one m uh, one sac is showing uh, only the yolk sac and it is not growing as uh, per the other two sacs so all that this uh, lady will probably require is counseling a good progesterone support a lot of tlc and probably that uh, sac will just uh, shrivel over time and the two pregnancies grow ahead and in case that does not happen we always have an option to do a fetal reduction at uh, 11 to 12 weeks of pregnancy so we are coming to the topic now of fetal reduction assuming that this particular third pregnancy manages to grow after all your conservative management i'd like to introduce dr monica tomar ma'am back into the discussion ma'am what is your experience with fetal reduction should it be done is it a dangerous procedure how do you counsel your patients so fetal reduction talking about fetal reduction if there are more than 2 3 then uh, i think uh, the pregnancy becomes safer a twin pregnancy is safer than a triplet or a quadruple pregnancy and uh, ultrasound guided kcl injection they can if done properly judiciously i think Uh, that they can go a long way in helping the patient uh, to get live babies at the end of the pregnancy thank Very you ma'am we should not discuss now it's an established procedure so there is no controversy as regards fetal reduction in more than two pregnancies so dr archana mehta ma'am this patient 
I'm I'm taking a hypothetical patient now. We are moving away from this patient to discuss a hypothetical situation where there is a twin pregnancy and the patient feels twins is too much. I can't handle twin pregnancy. Doctor, एक को कम कर दो, एक ही रहना चाहिए. What would be your opinion? No, no. I will not. From twin, can this. we reduce to single twin? Is it recommended? No, no. And why not? No, it is not. It should not be. I don't. I will not recommend her. I will counsel her that although there are some problems in twin pregnancy, uh, there can be problems, but uh, there are successful pregnancies also. So she should continue with twin pregnancy. Okay. But the uh, the outcome of multiple pregnancy is measured to up till which gestation the pregnancy can be carried. So okay. for twin pregnancies, it has been seen that it can be successfully carried till thirty-seven weeks of pregnancy, which is a reasonable time for the viability of both the fetuses. So there is no point in reduction in two pregnancies. But as you go to three and four, the viab uh, the the probability of taking the pregnancy to thirty-two weeks, thirty-four weeks, then further lessens to twenty-eight weeks. That is But why. But madam, I have seen on Facebook that one woman has six or seven children at one time. But it is not just one month. It is also important. 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 in case the woman is having any uh, medical illnesses wherein she continuing with the twins is having a problem uh, to her life if she is uh, say uh, gestation uh, not gestation sorry essential diabetic or essential hypertension and she is undergone ivf uh, then it would definitely be safer for us to manage a singleton pregnancy than a twin pregnancy so if it is uh, 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 if, if it is not a monochorionic monoamniotic uh, twins but di di twins then with a guarded risk with good hands we might be able to uh, reduce one of the two twins looking at the maternal indication absolutely correct so this just goes to prove that there is no universal law in medicine everything has its exceptions everything has absolute and relative contraindication and you should be able to give the right advice judging what is the situation in that particular patient who is sitting across the table i just quickly run through what the evidence is on twin and triplet pregnancies this is a retrospective study from finland using their national data over a period of 27 years they had 23500 twin pregnancies over 27 years 46000 plus live births 600 plus still births 45% were born preterm 47% had cesarean section the incidence of preeclampsia from singleton to twin increased to 17% gdm rose to 20% incidence of intrahepatic cholestasis for which often there is no treatment is much higher pph is more frequent if you want one single reference for your patients which shows you what are the complications this is one very good reference to have on the tips of your fingers this is also a graph which they have in the same publication we have talked about fetal reduction i just quickly want to present to you 17 years data from a greek group which looked at over 1000 trichorionic triamniotic pregnancies with expectant management the incidence of preterm birth was in excess of 50% but when you did a reduction to twins which is more than 600 of those cases the risk of preterm birth reduced to 17% as all of us are aware preterm is one of the largest factors causing neonatal and perinatal morbidity and mortality all the forest plots clearly in favor of fetal reduction let's go to the next case since such it has mentioned this about high risk this is a patient who is an insulin dependent diabetic her blood and urine sugars are currently well controlled she underwent hysterolaparoscopy 2 months back and spontaneously conceived with iui so maybe somewhere in the back of your mind is that 
flushing tubal flushing or hydro tubation was all that was required you cleared the block tube she is conceived spontaneously now she presents with abdominal pain missed period bleeding per vaginum ultrasound shows an 8 mm sac in the right adnex dr sachin dalal what would you like to do for her she is a diabetic lady who is conceived after histolaparoscopy and now she has an unruptured tubal ectopic pregnancy sachin you are muted pratik there was a network uh, issue i just logged in again let me just uh, okay this. then maybe somebody else can take this up dr madhulika saha madam would you like to take that and start uh she is a uh, 32 year old patient uh, diabetic yes so, uh, on ultrasound we have on ultrasound we have found that uh, there is a topic of 8 mm now there is uh, uh, no option we have uh, to go uh, for the surgical panel. intervention the indications uh, here for surgical interventions is because the uh, this adenoxal mass is more than 8 uh, 4 minutes so here the surgery is required and the preferred surgery may be salpingostomy or salpingectomy and uh, this disease depends if the opposite tube contralateral tube is normal and mobile and seems uh, norm um, uh, working then we can uh, do salpingectomy but because she is a infertile patient uh, uh, if we want to save the tube this tube uh, we can do selping was me although in this case selping jet b if the other uh, tube is normal it will will be the preferred choice because it provides further chances of normal pregnancy is more if we do uh, selping jet b i see dr ruchi shrivastava is raising her hand we she has a different point of view Uh, so the stress because she is okay. a diabetic patient as well, and uh, there are two problems. Now she is a uh, topic pregnancy also, so definitely the stress of surgery, anesthesia, and less is it increases the counter regulatory hormones like cortisol, glucagon, growth hormones, corticalcalcol, uh, uh, corticalamines. So they are in purpose. They are going to in turn in decrease the insulin secretion, and it will increase. is the insulin resistance in these patients so we have one more option insulin per se is not the contraindication to start with methotrexate the medical management in these patients so uh, we though again methotrexate also has its own problem because insulin is going to cause the uh, increased risk of the liver problems and the infections whereas methotrexate has its own inclusion and exclusion criteria so for the contraindication of the methotrexate one of the thing is the hepatic dysfunction and the renal dysfunctions we have to see that the patient is not anemic uh, she is not she is not having thrombocytopenia the pulmonary she is not having any pulmonary active disease or peptic ulcers so there are certain more criteria and uh, finally if we are going to uh, the diabetes is uh, con well controlled so methotrexate can be tried in this patient because uh, the sac size is less than 35 mm and uh, what we have to go in for this is on day one we have to get a serum beta hcg done and uh, we can go in for me So if all the criteria are fulfilled, we go in for the serum. Uh, we go in for uh, metho single dose methotrexate, that is 50 milligram per liter square, can be given intramuscularly to the patient. And then the serum beta HCG is to be done again on the fourth day and the seventh day. And we have to see the measurements or the levels of the beta HCG on the fourth and the seventh day. If the fall is more than 15 percent, that means a treatment is on the success on a successful side. Uh, if it is plateauing or it is increasing then again we have to go in for a further dosing but because keeping in mind that she is already diabetic we have one more point because she must be no. on insulin because if she is on metformin we cannot take her for we cannot give methotrexate or we cannot go in for the surgery also so we have to switch over on insulin if she is on insulin definitely she would be on insulin because she is insulin dependent so she is on long acting insulin therapy so that 
has to be uh, stopped for two to three days because in the back of the mind there is that she can be converted into surgery later on or if the plateau is not decreasing or on a falling trend so i might take her up for surgery so we can switch over on the intermediate and the uh, the short acting insulin or we can go in for the regular insulin every actually uh, after every meal before every meal and intermediate at the bedtime so that would be the most preferable thing and uh, once the insulin is started we start on the methotrexate if it is functioning well we are patient is responding well to it and uh, beta hcg level is also in a decreasing trend we can continue we can follow up the patient she should be compliant also otherwise we'll go in for the surgery or laparoscopic surgery and uh, proceed thank you ma'am so i think you've covered all the management options quite exhaustively i'll just go over them once quickly for the benefit of the audience i see dr madhulika sai raising her hand yes ma'am yes uh, i differ from dr richi because although she is a diabetic case but because the size of the this ectopic is uh, am i audible yes ma'am it is good yes ma'am because the size of this uh, ectopic is uh, more than 4 uh, uh, this 4 mm and it is 8 mm then there are contraindications for methotrexate uh, treatment also no sir so, so sir, i am this... <laughs> sir i agree to the medical management now as we all have been trying medical management actively as dr ruchi has said the acog rcog or guidelines have liberalized medical management even uh, if you read textbook of novax thoroughly again you will find that even with presence of cardiac activity they have said that you can give a trial for medical management so for ectopic there is no that is beyond doubt that you should prefer medical management to surgical management whenever feasible but you should have a good backup and for emergency management that is you you should have laparoscopy in hand and in covid era she should have her covid rt pcr done also even if we are trying for medical management so that we can go for laparoscopic selping jostomy whenever needed and i don't think because i am an active endoscopic surgeon and ectopic is the first surgery which a surgeon tries so i have in all my cases i have been successfully doing selpingostomy and selpingectomy is never been required only i do it whenever i like i like supposing the patient already has babies i don't want to do a selpingostomy then only i go for it but medical management is the treatment of choice okay so i'll just quickly summarize what all our excellent okay. panelists have said she is a type 1 diabetes means she is an insulin dependent diabetic she is already on insulin the dose needs to be adjusted during pregnancy the size of the sac is quite small at present she doesn't have any syncopal attacks or anything suggesting that she may be a ruptured ectopic this is an un ruptured tubal ectopic at present there is a good acog management guideline from february 2018 there's an rcog guideline from november 2016 as well in fact the american college guideline had put up in one of our foxy newsletters a summary of that this is the gist of how serum beta hcg is to be monitored as rightly pointed out day 1 day 4 day 7 is what we look at if you find that the initial level is itself more than 5000 then it's a contraindication to medical management a sac size of more than 3 and a half or 4 cm in diameter again is a contraindication to medical management patient who are hemodynamically stable confirmed ectopic and are under observation very important are under observation you don't give methotrexate and send the patient home patient has to be admitted in hospital and should be closely supervised you will find that methotrexate usually fails if the levels are more than 5000 if it's less than 5000 then the failure rates are significantly lower there is some controversy whether single doses are enough there is some evidence to prove that if you give two doses then the success rate increases from 88% to nearly 93% which is 5% more whether this increase of 5% is appropriate and you are willing to take that increased risk of adverse drug reactions and all those other issues that is something which is up to each individual person regarding salpingostomy or salpingectomy has been clearly mentioned by both of our panelists if you have a healthy contralateral tube then salpingectomy can be performed 
this is what the rcog guideline says but in modern medicine most of us like to preserve the tube unless it is grossly distorted or it is already ruptured and the patient shows any evidence of gross pid usually we like to preserve the fallopian tubes as much as possible can we go to the next case this is a 34 year old she is married late has irregular cycles previously been treated for vaginal discharge with antibiotic therapy now she is conceived with ivf at 2 o'clock in the morning she is come with bleeding abdominal pain and she is prostrated lmp was 7 weeks ago and the last scan which was done showed an intrauterine pregnancy which was progressing well what is wrong with this lady dr arjuna mehta ma'am would you like to take that i think the case she is having uh, irregular cycles and she was treated for vaginal discharge with antibiotics means she was having some uh, pid and now she is conceived with ivf uh, the pregnancy although the one week back the ultrasound had shown seven weeks intrauterine pregnancy but you know now she has come with bleeding and pain abdomen so uh, first of all i would like to repeat her ultrasound to sh- make sure that now she is bleeding also and she is having pain also whether the baby the cardiac activity is there or not and simultaneously she is conceived with ivf so i have to keep high index of suspicion of heterotopic pregnancy Okay, very because, good. And how would because, you diagnose a heterotopic pregnancy, ma'am? So, uh, you know, uh, I would like to repeat her ultrasound, transvaginal sonography. I would like to repeat uh, to see whether there is any other. Uh, I, I I can see any other gestation uh, sac in the adenexa, uh, along with this intrauterine pregnancy, because you know IVF uh, is one of the very high risk factor for this uh, heterotopic pregnancy. So. Uh, now this uh, mo- and second thing is uh, there could be uh, this ultrasound was maybe that ultrasound was correct or that heterotopic intrauterine pregnancy is okay but that hit, uh, uh, ectopic pregnancy in the tube that has ruptured and that has led in the patient into acute abdomen so she has presented with acute abdomen basically now this uh, tubal uh, one pregnancy which, which was in the tubal has ruptured and there is an uh, pregnancy in the uterus also so uh, now i will have to if she is uh, hemodynamically unstable the treatment will be laparotomy or laparoscopy depending upon the expertise of the surgeon and the availability so that how that's how i will have to manage uh, if in uh, laparoscopy or laparotomy i can confirm the diagnosis and then treat the if it is ruptured i can do self inject me and uh, if i can preserve the tube i would like to preserve the tube thank you ma'am okay. dr ruchi shrivastav has raised her hand uh, since a long time sorry to keep you waiting ma'am please go ahead thank you sir uh, sir because this patient has come in agony and uh, this bleeding so as i said bleeding can be quite common in a in ivf pregnancy she has pain also so the dd has to be made because my res- resident as you said w- what advice you are going to give to your resident because i haven't reached the hospital yet so the advice what i have to give to my resident is first admit the patient definitely the formalities will be done by the relatives in the meantime uh, she has to take the vitals of the patient if she seems to be hemodynamically unstable we have to uh, set up to i we for uh, large bore cannulas so and the when we are putting the cannula we have to take the samples definitely we take few samples the most important being the hemoglobin and the hematocrit because that will decide about the bleeding uh, the amount of the bleeding which uh, has occurred in the patient uh, my dd comes first when she comes here and uh, my resident has told me about it that she is in pain the first thing i would like to tell her to uh, make her in trendinal position because that would be the right position so that uh, the uh, the supply would to the cardiac uh, supply would be better in this venous return is better yes and uh, she is uh, if we have to ask about the amount of the blood loss in this patient if she says she is, has been bleeding for last 12 hours continuously that is a severe bleeding and if she says she has been bleeding and using uh, one pad every hour for last 2 to 6 hours it is again a severe kind of a bleeding in that way i'm going to make a dd of uh, 
incomplete abortion it's just a dd i've started my management it could be in because uh, if she's not able to uh, assess or tell about the bleeding it could be inevitable abortion which is progressing into incomplete abortion and lastly very rightly said it could be ectopic pregnancy as well because one pregnancy was already seen earlier so it could be heterotopic pregnancy because in ivf 1.5 to 2% chances are there that the patient can have ectopic pregnancy as well so this is also there in my mind in the meantime i have to stabilize my patient oxygen by face mask if she is in a collapsible state because uh, the, uh, you had written over there and uh, aggressive iv fluids should be given to this patient especially the ringer I would prefer, prefer, and uh, the examination which includes is the per speculum examination before we uh, get her ready for the ultrasound and shift her to the for ultrasound. Per speculum examination, if the clots are present, we have to remove those clots and see for any trauma. Also, in the meantime, we are just diagnosing or um, uh, excluding other things as well. If I can see, or if she sees that the os is closed, there is no active bleeding. Definitely, I will stabilize and shift her for ultrasound. If she is bleeding and the products can be seen coming out through the or os, uh, I'll take this patient for suction and evacuation. Again, the in the meantime, if the ultrasound is done because uh, she is IVF patient, so we have to convince her yes, this pregnancy cannot continue further. So you have to be taken for suction and evacuation. So we have to um, for, uh, definitely for medical legal aspects also we have to. Make sure that the process of ultrasound is um, uh, is in my favor. And if uh, if everything is fine, then uh, if it is a heterotopic pregnancy, then whatever Dr. Ashna said, we'll definitely go in for those ones. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think that was very well covered by both of our panelists. And this is a simple algorithm which is there for all patients who have first trimester bleeding. And if you notice, the first branch on the top left always looks at emergency causes. Everything else can wait for routine appointment, external monitoring by a third-party observer, or by somebody who's a radiologist who's skilled in obstetric ultrasound. In an emergency situation like this, airway breathing circulation, two large IV bore cannulas. Collect your blood, send it for cross match. If possible, send an HCG at the same time and do a quick ultrasound to look for cardiac activity and viability. If the patient is in a stage of shock, then it means that the concealed hemorrhage which you are not seeing is more than the revealed hemorrhage which you will see on a per speculum examination. That shifts the balance towards emergency surgery and a laparotomy or a laparoscopy depending on the hemod hemodynamic situation of the patient. Heterotopic tubal pregnancies have increased from 1 in 30,000 to 1 in 4,000 because of modern ART practices. Especially in this particular patient, you saw that she had some history of being treated for PID and these kind of patients often will land up with complications during pregnancy when they do conceive. With patients who have PID and tubal damage or prior pelvic surgery, heterotopic pregnancies like you see in this particular picture are becoming more common. Unfortunately, all of us do a scan at six weeks to look for cardiac activity. When we see the cardiac activity, we are happy and we stop the scan. Especially those obstetricians or IVF specialists like me who do scans, we see cardiac activity, we are very happy. Our treatment has succeeded. We fail to evaluate the condition of the ovaries and the adnexa and that is when heterotopic pregnancy may be missed. So please always examine the adnexa even at six weeks. You can pick up a heterotopic quite well, quite early and that patient may not necessarily rupture and present to you an emergency like this patient in this case. This is a nice long-term study published in 2018. They had 144 cases of heterotopic pregnancy over 14 years and 90% of them had received fertility treatment, 7% of them had received ovulation induction. Incidence of spontaneous heterotopic is extremely low. It's something which we only read in the textbooks for answering a short note in an exam. And unfortunately, because of modern practices, we are seeing this much more commonly. To further continue, 65% of them had presented in shock and 85% of the intrauterine pregnancies could be continued if you detected it in time and you were able to treat it in time. 
we are nearly at 4:30 pm with your permission can we do one more case or should we call it a day so we can take one more case will do okay great so this is a 30 year old lady she has been referred to us by a local gynecologist for opinion patient had a missed period ultrasound showed an incomplete abortion check ureters was done post operatively she was fine but one week later at follow up she is still bleeding dr monica tomar ma'am this patient may have retained products of conception what do you think is wrong with her uh, since this patient has come back after a week with bleeding i would uh, keep the suspicion of infection or some sepsis i'll like to investigate her for anomalies in the uterus and even uh, think about uh, some trophoblastic tumors very good this pre ddl have to evaluate the moment the patient comes to me and uh, so how would you go about ruling out different things on your list of differential diagnostics so uh, first thing is i'll uh, take a history if she is a case of sepsis there will be some uh, history of fever some dirty discharge abdominal pain and in uh, if it is a case of uh, hello the trophoblastic tumor again i'll go for some blood investigation even urine pregnancy would turn out to be positive in that case because beta hcg levels are high if uh, if i suspect uh, she is a case of congenital anomalies of the uterus uh, ultrasonography is going to come to my uh, help i'll send her for a tvs i think that is still the best treatment like best investigation um, which can diagnose a number of anomalies so uh, history examination and then investigations will uh, and then followed by blood test again yes i'll do her uh, hemogram blood group hematocrit cbc uh, a beta hcg again is very important and simple uh, urine test in the opt i'll just send her for a upt Uh, to diagnose trophoblastic tumors. Thank you, ma'am. I think you've covered it quite, quite extensively. You've covered it, and some of the common things that are seen are sometimes you have products which are stuck in a corno, or this may be a patient who has local causes, though that will not give rise to such severe bleeding after one week if it's a local cause. Sometimes your vulvulum bite or your tentaculum bite can bleed, but definitely not so much, and you need to have a high index of suspicion. Dr. Ruchi Srivastava, ma'am, you had raised your hand. Please go ahead. Well, I wanted to start with the thing that uh, actually initially, if there is irregular bleeding in the first two weeks, uh, it can happen after even the check ureters. So first two weeks are okay. Only if the bleeding is excessive, then we have to manage this case. If it is one pad or uh, like two pads in a day, we can still wait for two weeks. in the meantime definitely the patient is going to come back has come back to me again so i'll take the entire history of fever if it is more than 100.4 degrees fahrenheit if there is a vaginal discharge which is particularly foul smelling if there is a tenderness or pain in the lower abdomen which is persistent for some time if it, there is a there we have to differentiate between the pain also if it's a cramping pain then it is due to the involution of the uterus if it is a persistent pain which is tender also on examination then these are the things which highlight on the uh, infection side and because one week has passed definitely i'm going to get the histopathology report by this time so i'm worried to confirm that it this was the pregnancy which i which i did the suction evacuation or the curettage was done or was it due to suspect un, which is not usually suspected is a gestational trophoblastic disease which is uh, which which actually i have come across with these type of cases so uh, i have a habit of finding out that hope this is not a molar pregnancy so we rule it out and uh, upt has no role because uh, in next 4 weeks it can beta hcg is uh, still persisting in the body for at least 4 to 6 weeks so, so quantitative it, estimation would be preferred in your opinion that would be better and uh, again uh -huh. one reading is not sufficient enough we have to get another one after 48 hours and uh, the other things uh, would uh, So if this was a persistent trophoblastic tissue or a GTN Dr Archana Mehta ma'am what would be your management in this lady how do you explain in simple lay person's language what is wrong with her I have to explain the patient that you are having some uh, sort of uh, matlab aage jaake tumhe jo hai jo placenta tumhara hota hai isme tumhara aage jaake kuch 
किसी तरह का जैसे कैंसर बनने का खतरा है सो यू हैव टू बी वेरी केयरफुल यू हैव टू बी अंडर क्लोज फॉलो अप एंड वॉट एवर ट्रीटमेंट वी एडवाइज यू हैव टू फॉलो यू हैव टू रिमेन स्ट्रिक्ट टू दैट सो एंड बिकॉज शी विल बी रिक्वायरिंग सीरियल बीटा एस सी जी फॉलो अप एंड वी विल कॉलिंग हर फॉर अल्ट्रासाउंड ऑल्सो देन शी हैज टू प्लान हर नेक्स्ट प्रेगनेंसी आफ्टर एटलीस्ट वन ईयर so post counts post uh, dnc if suppose we do her dnc post dnc counseling is also very important so we have to uh, tell her everything about the disease its consequences and how we are going to manage how we are going to follow up her so that will be a different prep so we will follow up according to that but most probably i think the cause in this patient i feel it is retained pyosis the first differential diagnosis always. i feel it is the retained products of consumption always always so in case it is a gtn then two important investigations which all of us should not forget first is the quantitative estimation as rightly pointed out if you find levels are more than 100000 miu per ml then you will find that many of these patients have a complete vesicular mole if you repeat an ultrasound always look at the ovaries because if you find multiple cysts in the ovaries that goes more in favor of what we call theca lutein cysts and the presence of these cysts in a series of more than 1000 patients has shown a sensitivity and a specificity exceeding 70% so even before you get your serum beta hcg value you yourself can do an ultrasound need not be transvaginal you can do a transabdominal ultrasound also and the theory is that the cysts are so large they can be easily diagnosed by you even with a simple transabdominal ultrasound it's important to know the theory of what is complete mole and what is partial mole because this has an impact on the future fertility of the patient the incidence of recurrence and how you are going to counsel this patient in future as rightly pointed out she will need to have a serial estimation over a period of 9 to 12 months and only when the hcg levels reach zero that is when she is advised to conceive again needless to say she needs to be having barrier contraception in between doing a repeat curettage for a patient who has an extremely soft uterus and where there is a vesicular mole inside is not to be taken lightly if possible do it under ultrasound guidance with good general anesthesia and anesthetist there on standby don't do it with iv sedation and local anesthesia you will come to grief because these patients can have a lot of systemic issues and anesthetist themselves need to be informed well in advance that this patient has a vesicular mole for evacuation because there are certain medications that they would like to avoid and certain things that they need to be aware of and to look out for as dr arshana varma has pointed out earlier if rh negative then anti d needs to be given and you need to follow up these patients serially and try and ensure that they do not slip through the most common main reason for patients coming back to you is because they fail to follow up they fail to understand the importance of follow up and that's why i asked dr arshana mehta how will you explain in the patient's own language the importance of what she is undergoing and what is the treatment for the same i'd like to thank all of my panelists for a fantastic panel i think we had a huge range of backgrounds not only from somebody who is in teaching hospitals but also people from art those who are in private practice those who are currently in professorial positions and they have gone through the entire gamut of the cases i can see them nodding their heads because they've seen all this in their practice and this is very much relevant to day to day practice when we talk about first trimester bleeding it's not only important to know the common causes like threatened miscarriage but also to talk about these newer conditions which we are now seeing more frequently in our practice i'd like to invite all of our panelists to give one simple clear take home message for the audience before we close we'll start with dr ruchi shivasta top left uh, so if it's ivf pregnancy and the patient is bleeding in the first trimester so do not panic counsel your patient because uh, there are very high chances that the patient can have uh, bleeding in the first trimester and more than 50% of these patients they definitely are going to recover well and will uh, continue with to the term pregnancy so progesterone cures all illnesses in the first trimester thank you very much dr arjuna mehta uh, 
I would like to say that if a lady with spontaneous uh, abortion comes to you, she needs uh, good counseling and assurance. And you know the TLC we know it is it has very importance and it costs nothing, but it is going to uh, give a very long, strong bonding with gynecologist. So I would uh, like to uh, give uh, TLC to these patients That's and subsequent planning of pregnancy. TLC, good pre-pregnancy counseling and good and interval pregnancy them, counseling. To prepare them for subsequent pregnancy. Very good point. Thank you. Dr. Monica Tomar, ma'am, there are over 600 people logged in and they are waiting to hear from you. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to the uh, message I would like to give everybody is that for medical termination, combination of mifepristone and mesoprostone works wonder. It is better over uh, mesoprostone alone. Uh, giving mesoprostone vaginally or orally uh, alone is not uh, that good. It should be combined with mifepristone if you have to get hundred percent result. Medical Thank you, termination. Uh, so it's important to stress modern practices medical methods over surgical method and try not to cause more problems to the patient primum non no sir as hippocrates used to say dr madhulika sahay ma'am i will uh, give my opinion is when you are dealing with uh, this cases of early uh, pregnancy bleeding whatever we have discussed we should take in, in our mind the detailed background what things can uh, are causing this threaten or this uh, uh, blighted ovum on an embryonic pregnancy and we should not make the patient afraid but we should give them proper counseling and proper picture uh, so that they can take uh, precautions and they can understand the uh, prob their problem and they will cooperate in the treatment and they will not get panicky so besides tender loving care, we should also counsel them properly, keeping all the things in mind. Good counseling and appropriate guidance is something which never goes out of fashion. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Priyanka Garg, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for such a wonderful panel. Uh, the message I would like to give is that today in the era of evidence-based medicine, we should do whatever we can do to prove ourselves correct for the patient and also for us. So you should not just believe on a simple ultrasound. If you require MRI, you should go for that as well. If you feel that you require biochemical tests. So there are a battery of tests like serum beta HCG, serum progesterone, and even these tests can be repeated, which can help us in the management. Plus histopathology of the RPOCs is the backbone of success. You should have a histopathology and if possible, you can go for microarrays. Thank you. Tissue diagnosis, karyotyping, and taking advantage of everything that you have access to in your practice is of equal importance. Dr. Sachin Dalal, we lost you for a minute there. I think there were some internet issues, but we are glad to welcome you back. Any closing uh, remarks or messages, sir? Yeah, Pratik, hi. I would like to give a message to our fellow Gynex and especially young budding Gynex who are there on the uh, audience that yourself get trained in sonography, invest in a good sonography machine so that when a patient comes uh, with first trimester bleeding, or pain, you don't shuttle the woman from uh, your clinic to the radiologist clinic or if she comes on a Saturday evening when the radiologist will only be available on Monday morning, you can immediately do the diagnosis and give an adequate care to the patient. So get a good machine and get trained in using the machine. So appropriate training, PCP and DT licensing and ensuring that you yourself are available on the weekends for your patients. <laughs> <laughs> and not away attending conference. <laughs> Good one, <Patik. laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Sachin Dalal. Congratulations to all the panelists. We had a very beautiful panel and I'm really privileged to be here with all of you. Dr. Archana Verma, ma'am, handing over yes. to you for the closing remarks and the vote of thanks officially to be presented. Yes. Uh, uh, really, Dr. Pr uh, Pratik, all the panelists I was listening they were outstanding and especially uh, I can say that I was thinking who is the best but now what uh, Kamal ke There is no dispute, <laughs> Archana Verma is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. All my favorite and uh, this Greater Noida team and Banaras team, oh my god, all the all these and Gorapur, yes. So, 
uh, not not Gorakhpur, Banaras is the uh, uh, here and uh, Monica and Madhika. Dono. और मुझे इतना ज्यादा टाइम दिया उसके लिए थैंक यू सारे चेयरपर्सन को थैंक यू और साइंस एंड टेक्रा को थैंक यू सबको थैंक्स बहुत बहुत मेनी मेनी थैंक्स Thank you, ma'am. So, Thank to you. present the official vote of thanks, along with Dr. Archana Verma, I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude to the Amogs office bearers, our president, Dr. Nandita Palchetkar, secretary, Dr. Arun Nayak, to our chairpersons, Dr. Arun Nayak, Dr. Parul Kotradawala, who took time out from their difficult and busy schedules, Dr. Kirti Dubey. I saw Madam right till the end. She's still here with us. Ah, Thank you Dr. so Dr. much, ma'am, for being with us. Dr. Gulati Sir is also still with us. Oh, it was a lovely panel, and I really loved hearing it. Thank you. You so are much. an excellent moderator. Thank excellent. you so much. Really appreciate it. Also, Dr. Uma Pandey, who, despite her busy schedule, she took time out to share green tea with us today. Dr. Ravindra Jit Khurana was there right from the beginning of the program. To our excellent panelists and to Dr. Archana Verma, thank you for coordinating this program. My co-convener, it would have been impossible to do it without you. Science Integra team, Shrimon, Session, Subu, thank you always for being our scientific backbone. and last but not least bharat serums and vaccines who are our academic partners for today apne rh isomerization acha bola they will be very grateful to you <laughs> thank you so much everybody more than 600 people have been logged in today thank you very much audience for being there and we look forward to seeing all of you very soon thank you thank you thank you so much thank you so much namaste kee madam thank you thank you